بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبيه الكريم As always we begin in the name of Allah the most compassionate the most merciful indeed all praise belongs to Allah Azza wa Jal and we send salutations of peace and blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Assalamu alaikum everyone I uh, hope you are doing well and jazakumullah khair for joining us on this Sunday uh, morning so thank you so much for, for uh, taking the time. Um, the first thing I would ask, if possible, because um, there's some, uh, Bismillah. So there's a number of you guys who are going by, by like acronyms or maybe different names. So uh, basically what I'm saying is if you could just make your username, your actual name, uh, just so you know who's here and who's not here. Jazakumullahu khair. Jazakumullahu khair. Okay. So... This is our Dawa workshop. Uh, the plan for today, it's scheduled till three, uh, but there's gonna be a, a, at least a one hour break in there. Um, and we may finish early depending on, on how, how quickly we get through things. Um, my style usually is, I, I don't wanna like, just, I don't want it to be me talking for two hours. So um, if you guys have any questions, uh, please do ask uh, as things come up. Okay, and then we'll also have time for questions at the end, inshallah, broader questions. But if there's anything unclear, you're not sure about, um, if I start lagging or anything, please just let me know. Um, okay, so let's begin. Bismillah. So we are recording. Okay, we're good on that. So Dawah Workshop, why are we here? First and foremost, right? We should take a moment to purify our intentions and specifically in accordance with this ayah of the Quran. A'udhu billahi minash shaytan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And who is better in speech than one who invites to Allah and does righteousness and says, indeed, I am of the Muslims. Right? So this is one of the best things you can do as a Muslim, especially living in a non-Muslim country. Especially living in a non-Muslim uh, country. So... This is the foundation for our work in Ask a Muslim, okay? Now, uh, a little bit about Ask a Muslim Canada. First of all, my name is, uh, who am I? Uh, I'm Brother Omar, Omar Abdel Fattah. Uh, in my official capacity, I guess, I'm the uh, president of Ask a Muslim. Um, regarding uh, Ask a Muslim in general. Now, we are one Dawah organization, mm. uh, but Alhamdulillah, as you'll see, we're not very, um, uh sectarian i guess okay. um you'll see oh, what okay. sorry brother are you <laughs> oh, that was just my accent okay, no worries. so um the history of ask a muslim uh ask a muslim started um started a while ago years we're talking uh way before we started here in canada they are a Dawah organization that started out of Columbus, Ohio. So they have American roots. Um, they started with their Dawah booths over there. And they actually, uh, at one point had, uh, you know, they had like a, like a, a minivan and even like a, a food pantry. Uh, but basically they started over there and then they went online. And Alhamdulillah online, you guys might be familiar with Ask a Muslim US. Uh, they are the ones that uh, started in Columbus, Ohio. And essentially, they grew, alhamdulillah, to well over a million followers. And that is where they're at today. They have over a million uh, followers. I got involved with them. So they've been here for, for many years. Um, I got involved with them roughly around 2016. I was living in Japan at the time. And uh, they made a post saying that they're looking for new people to join their team. And I said, subhanAllah, even though I'm living in, you know, in Japan, I can still you know, help them out online, right? So Alhamdulillah, I, I, I contacted them, uh, they accepted me, and I began working with them. Uh, first, it started with me answering questions in their inbox. They get many, many, many questions, like every day. Like the inner inbox is like constantly full, or constantly, uh, you know, with an influx of messages. Um, and uh, I started with them. I started answering their questions. Then, um, alhamdulillah, I took a more active role. I started making content for them. So I started making videos, uh, at least one voice recording from what I understand, from what I remember, sorry. 
And so I, that's, I got, I guess, say a more active role with them um, when it comes to their content. And then eventually, when I was coming back home to Canada in 2017, I, I came up with the idea. I said, you know what? Like when I was living back home in Canada, I never really saw Muslims giving dawah. So why don't we have like a Ask a Muslim? Why don't we branch Ask a Muslim to Canada? And I can be like the official Ask a Muslim Canada person to start. So Alhamdulillah, they agreed. They liked the idea. We started with, uh, with um, so we started basically our, our dawah booth. Now the dawah booth, when we first started, uh, was literally... Our organization here in Canada when we first started was literally myself uh, and a plastic bag with t-shirts and pamphlets. And for those of you guys who have been following the Ask a Muslim chat, uh, I'm pretty sure those are now in the biohazard box because <laughs> they've been uh, attacked by mice. But um, alhamdulillah for everything. So that's how we started. And eventually the brothers, uh, I don't know if attacked, attacked is kind of a strong word. They've been infiltrated by mice, right? So Anyways, so when we started, alhamdulillah, it was, it was myself in one plastic bag. And now you've seen, you guys can see kind of the growth that we have. We're an official nonprofit registered federally and in BC. Alhamdulillah, we have many, many volunteers. Uh, we have a board of directors that consists of myself and three other members who are uh, Brother Naveed, uh, Sister Rashida, and Sister Hiba. And together, basically, we formed the board and the official, um, I guess, voting members of the organization. And, uh, and that's where we're at today, alhamdulillah. And we have plans to continue uh, growing. Now, any questions about this stuff? Anything that we just mentioned here? About Ask a Muslim, the organization? And it's important to be clear, we are, we are a nonprofit, but we are not a charity. So we're not a registered charity, so we don't give out tax receipts. But well, we are registered with the government of Canada and the government of BC. Okay, so no questions. Let's continue, inshallah. So these are, so you'll see our Dawa booth on the right. Now, this is not our exact location anymore, and this store actually doesn't even exist. Uh, we are a little bit further down the street, but Alhamdulillah shows you kind of our setup. We also are very well connected with the Metro Town booth. Uh, they are an independent partner. And you'll see there, they have uh, one of our posters there. And in addition to that, I think I might be breaking up, right? What I'm gonna do is if I'm, uh, I'm gonna try turning off my camera and then maybe that'll speed up the connection. Okay, so, so yeah, so that's the Surrey booth. And then we have the, uh, the Metro Town booth as an independent partner. And we also work with, pretty much every other Sunni Dawa organization there is in, in, in BC or Canada. Alhamdulillah, um, I, I, I know personally, and I met personally with the uh, director of AIRA Canada, Brother Othman, uh, we work together. Uh, I, I go to him for advice pretty regularly when things come up. Um, we work with Brother Adnan with Bridging Gaps. Um, you know, pretty much anybody giving Dawa, we, we work together with essentially. So Alhamdulillah. Now, what is our vision for Dawa? Okay, because every organization should have a vision. Our vision for Dawa is Dawa that is sincere. This is extremely important, and, and we're going to be repeating this a lot. Dawa that is sincere, based on Quran and Sunnah, consistent, and growing. Okay, so we're not trying to basically be like Dawa. In a very simple term, we're not trying to be like Dawa superstars in, in like overnight and then just everything ends soon after that. We want consistency and we want growth. So this is our, um, our vision. And to help us remember that, we, we're using the acronym SB, uh, SBCG, right? Sincere based on Quran and Sunnah, consistent and growing. So that is our focus in Dawa. Okay. Now, I want to take this moment to review some uh, very important policies that we have to tell you about our organization and to tell you kind of what we expect from ourselves and pretty much everybody associated with the organization. So I'm going to just be stopping sharing for a moment. and I'm going to open up another uh, share screen here. Let's see.
So I think you guys can see my home screen here. Okay, so we're gonna go over, I think you can see the policy in front of me, ask Muslim code of conduct and policies. So um, these are basically, this is our code of conduct and our policies that we expect pretty much everybody to abide with, including the directors and the founder, everybody. So it says recent as of July 6th, but that it's recent as of today. It hasn't changed uh, since we made it. So first of all, we need to know that Ask a Muslim is a Sunni organization and specifically we're a Sunni non-sectarian organization. So I'm not going to read everything, but I'm just going to highlight some of the main points. What this means is that we, we don't follow any specific school of thought. We have people who are Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali, Salafi. Uh, we have people who follow all, pretty much every branch of um, uh, every branch of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, right? And sorry, I'm just gonna inshallah, I'm just gonna mute everyone just to minimize background noise. So basically, we, we don't follow any one specific school of thought. Now, why is this important? Because um, we, we want an environment where everybody feels welcome. So I'll give you an example. If you're like, if you grew up in Pakistan or Lebanon or Syria or Bangladesh, everybody kind of follows one fiqh or one school of thought, right? And of course, there are probably some differences here and there, but generally speaking, everybody follows one school of thought. Now, that's that's all good, but when you come to Canada, and I've seen this from from I've seen this different times, people begin getting people are exposed to different understandings of the religion, and it's important that we realize that these people are still from Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and there are just differences of opinions regarding certain issues. So, for example, some people don't know, but in the in the Hanafi school of thought, somebody who um, laughs during salah. Not only is their salah broken, but their wudu is also broken. Okay, I remember when somebody who grew up in the Shafi'i Madhab heard that they were shocked by it. They were shocked, and that's fine to be shocked. But we ha there's a fine line between, you know, being shocked and then being disrespectful and saying no, like that's just barbaric or something like that. You know, because all of the schools of thoughts, their their opinions are founded in some dalil, some evidence from the Quran and Sunnah, right, or qiyas or analogy. So, um, uh, so basically what we're trying to say is we welcome everybody from Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah that doesn't extend to Shias and others, right? We are specifically Sunni um, and we just respect, we just expect all our uh, members to show a level of respect for the different madahibs, for the different schools of thought, regardless if they agree with them or disagree with them. Okay, that's pretty much all, all that we're saying. Um, this is very important. Ask a Muslim does not tolerate, uh, accept, nor promote any fringe opinions or deviant opinions. And I mentioned some of them here. Like, for example, we don't say these opinions are absolutely not accepted in our, in our organization. Homosexual relationships are permissible under Islamic law. There are some people who identify as Muslim hold that view. Um, heterosexual relationships outside of marriage are permissible, right? You know, I've also seen people try to validate this. The hijab is not obligatory. This is not an opinion we hold and we won't tolerate somebody um, having that opinion or, or, and sharing it in our organization. And even things like music is permissible, right? We, you may have that opinion in your own personal life, but when it comes to dawah and when it comes to what we teach, we do not teach, we do not teach uh, this opinion, okay? So I just wanna make that clear, okay? Any questions about this section or is that pretty straightforward? Bismillah, let's continue. So we have a brothers and a sisters policy. They're very similar, but um, uh, basically this is when it comes to giving dawah. So Ask a Muslim encourages and welcomes brothers from all backgrounds to give dawah. And we recognize that dawah, and, and, and we're gonna go into this, but dawah doesn't just mean street dawah. It can mean online dawah, informal dawah, speaking to somebody at work or school, etc. cetera. Um, this is important. Ask a Muslim acknowledges that dawah done by both men and women must always be performed in a way that is based on the Quran and Sunnah, is pleasing to Allah and minimizes fitna. This is important. And we're going to talk about what exactly that means. Uh, when giving dawah, the following guidelines must be adhered to by all members. Um, men should avoid unnecessarily initiating, engaging, and or continuing conversation 
with women slash sisters when sisters are available and present. So generally speaking, our approach is as follows. We have brothers and sisters at the booth, right? <clears throat> we encourage and basically require and demand of brothers. If they're in a situation where there's a sister there, the brothers would initiate conversations with the brothers and the sisters would uh, initiate conversations with the non-Muslim uh, women, right? Or the Muslim women who come to the booth. Now, sometimes naturally you're gonna start a conversation. This happens to me quite regularly. Naturally, somebody's gonna be walking by, they stop at the booth and you say, hey, uh, feel free to, you know, whatever you, you say to the person to get them engaged with the booth. Naturally, you're gonna be speaking to somebody of the opposite gender. So what we say there is essentially, instead of carrying on an in-depth conversation about, you know, different, different things, if possible, the, 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 the man should pass on the conversation with the sister to a female booth member. And the sister who's speaking to a man should pass on the conversation to a male member of the booth. That is the ideal situation. Of course, everything is contextual, uh, but that is what we uh, strongly promote and encourage. Uh, men are strongly encouraged to initiate and continue conversations with other men, as we said. And when there is a need to exchange, so when there is a need to exchange contact information with a female slash sister, following discussion, men may provide the contact information of a female team member with their permission. Brothers may take a female's uh, contact information. However, that contact information should be immediately forwarded to a female team member who will continue the conversation with the sister, okay? Um, so even when it comes to exchanging contact information, the information should be shared with people of the same gender. And this is not to, this is not because we, you know, we think that, you know, you guys are weak in Iman or something like that. No, this is a general, um, this is a, a, a general principle that applies to everybody, even our, our, our board members, everybody. And the reason is, the reason is because as humans were created weak, as Allah says in the Quran, وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفَ And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that the, the, the most harmful fitna to men, right? Of my ummah is women. And the Quran mentions different things. So the point is, this is not because we don't have confidence or we think you're going to fall into sin. This is just, um, this is basically just to deal with the, the, the reality of gender relations, especially in the West. Okay. Sisters policy is largely the same thing. Um, uh, so everything is pretty much the same. Sisters should avoid unnecessarily initiating, engaging, or continuing conversations with men uh, slash brothers when brothers are available and present. Uh, sisters are strongly encouraged to initiate conversations with sisters. And uh, same thing when it comes to exchanging contact information. So sisters should not give out their personal contact information except to another sister. And when they are getting the contact information of a, of a, of a male, they should uh, hand that over to, uh, to a Muslim brother. Okay. I think that's pretty straightforward. Are there any questions about these two sections? You can type, you can unmute yourselves, you can, whatever is easy. Okay, Jazakumullah khair. I think they're great guidelines. It saves us from fitna. Alhamdulillah, I mean, it's nothing too like revolutionary, right? <laughs> or just basic stuff. Okay. Um, so dawah etiquettes when engaging with the opposite gender, um, in cases where a sister or brother engages, so there's, as we said, there's gonna be times when you naturally engage with somebody of the opposite gender um, for legitimate reasons as determined by this policy of the Quran and Sunnah um, and uh, with the latter two taking precedence over the former. What that means is the Quran and Sunnah take precedence over this policy, right? Uh, we are not scholars, uh, but we do consult scholars. Um, and uh, so when there's a mistake in this policy, obviously the Quran and Sunnah take precedence. So when we engage with the opposite gender, these are the following standards that must be upheld. The conversation obviously must never take place in isolation, okay? The brother sister must be dressed in accordance with the Quran and Sunnah. We're, we're, I'm, I'm gonna go over the uh, dress code that we have. Uh, the conversation must be professional, direct, and to the point. Uh, this is one of those things in the religion that, you know, when we, when we are permitted to speak to the opposite gender in legitimate, for legitimate reasons, it should be direct. It shouldn't be like, hey, how's it going? How's your summer going? Oh yeah, this weather, oh yeah. Like it, it shouldn't be flirtatious, right? And that's the, with point E. The conversation must be respectful, obviously, and that's to men and women. And the conversation must never be over, overly friendly or flirtatious and uh, appropriate distance should be maintained. 
Uh, I think we made this, yeah, this was during COVID. So for COVID reasons and for non-COVID reasons, appropriate distance should be maintained. Uh, the brother and sister should try their best to display the Islamic concept of modesty, haya, right? Al haya umin al iman. So uh, modesty is part of faith. So uh, we should be trying to display that. And there should obviously be no physical touching of any kind, including handshakes and hugs. Okay, obviously. So um, that's our that's our policy when it comes to engaging with the opposite gender, right? Um, and I think we all know that it's not haram necessarily to speak to somebody of the opposite gender when there's a reason, like you're lost and there's no, like for example, in my case, if I'm lost and there's no brothers around, I can definitely speak to a sister and say, excuse me, how do I get to this place, right? So that's, that's completely fine uh, Islamically, uh, but it shouldn't be done uh, just for, you know, uh, small talk. Okay, anti-extremism, anti-terrorism policy. Again, we have to put, the reason why we have these policies is because, um, you know, we have to protect the, the dawah and protect the organization. So sometimes, you know, if somebody comes in and says something crazy, whoever it may be, right, we can say, well, that's not what our organization stands for or promotes. So Ask a Muslim believes in, in and promotes the peaceful prop uh, propagation of the religion of Islam. So Alhamdulillah, we're living here in, in, in Canada where they allow us to give dawah. Um, so we believe in the promotion. We believe in an invitation, essentially, uh, to Islam. Um, and we, we believe in this in line with the following verse of the Quran. There, is no, there should be no compulsion in the acceptance of religion. The right course has become clear from the wrong. So we are not on the street forcing people to accept Islam. We are simply inviting them. Okay, and, and that's pretty much it. Um, Ask a Muslim prohibits everyone pretty much, whether directly or indirectly, to use any kind of physical violence, coercion, and or threat as a means of getting one or more people to enter Islam. Obviously, that, that goes against their religion and it goes against our policy. <clears throat> so Ask a Muslim Canada believes in informed consent and free will when it comes to people choosing to enter Islam. So we are not here. So this is important. We're not here just trying to get people to say their shahada and not know what they're saying. Right? So, so when somebody takes their shahada, you want to make sure that they actually understand what they're doing. Okay? So it's not just like, oh, I just want to hear the shahada and then that's it. Right? Um, and you're trying to you're kind of deceiving them into taking it, thinking that they're doing something else, right? So we want to make sure that people understand what they're doing and they're choosing to do so willfully, okay? Um, Ask a Muslim believes that Islam was and is a balanced religion from the onset of its revelation until today and thus does not require modification and or change of any kind. This, this goes right in the face of modernists who say, oh, well, you need to change the religion. Or some Christians, we hear from some, some non-Muslims that say, oh, well, Islam needs to undergo a reform right? But we don't believe that. We believe that Islam is, um, is a balanced religion in and of itself, right? And the sunnah is a balanced way of life. So, um, so this is what we believe and what we promote. So uh, Ask a Muslim Canada prohibits the preaching of unjust violence, injustice, hatred towards any individual or group, regardless of late race, national origin, national ethnic origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, color, religion, sex, age, or mental physical disability. Now, this is important, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity. This does not mean that we cannot state Islam's position on homosexuality or, or transgenderism. It just means that we do not preach the unjust violence of anyone, right? Of course, we can teach what the Quran and Sunnah state, but we don't preach the unjust violence or injustice uh, towards, towards uh, you know, these groups, right? Um, okay, and then... Uh, I think this is all because, you know, we're speaking to Sunni Muslims. This is all straightforward. I, I, I'll share with this, inshallah, I'll share a, a copy of this in the, in the WhatsApp group, just if you guys want to take, go over it in more detail. Um, but obviously, it's just saying that we base our understanding of Islam based on the Quran, Sunnah, uh, and the, uh, you know, the, the consensus, consensus of scholars, essentially. And we respect legitimate differences of opinions among respectable uh, scholars. Um, Okay, so this is important. This is kind of, we've already mentioned this, but Ask a Muslim prohibits people from formulating their own understanding of the religion that is based on misunderstood or miscontextualized verses and or hadith. And Ask a Muslim, ask a Muslim promotes the acquisition of knowledge through qualified teachers as opposed to self-study. Okay, so an example of this is one time I was in the masjid and uh, this brother was telling me um, 
this brother was was telling me, oh, Christians and Jews, uh, he was asking me, he's like, do Christians and Jews go, go to uh, heaven? And I said, not if they die on that, no. And he's like, then what do you say about the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, where Allah says, Until the end of the, the verse, which says, indeed, those who have believed, and the, and the Jews and the Christians and then the Sabians, whoever believes in Allah in the last day and does good, then they will have the reward with Allah. So this person has took this verse out of Surah Al-Baqarah and basically has kind of taken their own understanding, right? When he doesn't realize that there's a hadith that says, right? Right? Another hadith which says, by the one is in, in whose hands Muhammad, Muhammad saw sallallahu alayhi wasallam is, there's, there's no one from this ummah, a Christian or a Jew who hears of me, and then he dies and does not believe in what I have been sent with, except that he is a dweller of the hellfire. So basically what I'm trying to say is, our members, our boards, anybody associated with the organization uh, cannot cherry pick verses to fit their own agenda or to fit their own misunderstood understanding of Islam. Okay, I, I hope that's pretty clear. Okay, uh, managers policy, this only applies to booth managers. Basically, basically managers have these responsibilities and um, managers as, as pretty much the policy says we can appoint managers to, to overrun a booth and managers may be uh, replaced, uh, terminated um, at the discretion of the booth, uh, at the uh, discretion of the board of directors at any time. And obviously it also says managers do not own, uh, own the DAO booths, right? They, they are just serving the DAO booths, okay? And that's pretty much it. Uh, any questions about our policies? I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna share this in the uh, WhatsApp group. So you guys, if you wanna take a look at it in more detail, you can, uh, but that's, that's pretty much it. Any, any questions about this? No? Okay. Bismillah. So uh, next we have one more policy that I want to go over and it's, it's, it's a lot shorter. It's our dress code. Now, we do have a dress code um, and uh, it's not revolutionary as you'll see. Um, ask a Muslim dress code policy. Uh, the following dress code applies to all directors, members, volunteers, affiliates, uh, and anyone else directly or indirectly associated with Ask a Muslim while representing the organization and or giving dawah. So refusal to follow the dress code and or repeated violations of the dress code are grounds for disciplinary action up to and including removal from Ask a Muslim. So you'll see, we, do, we don't have like a uniform, but we have simple things that are all based off the Quran and Sunnah. So I'll start with the men. So for men, dues, obviously wear Sharia compliant clothing, don't come in short shorts which is sadly fashionable today amongst teenagers and others. Uh, dress modestly, right? We should be trying to dress uh, modestly, especially at the Dawah booth. Um, grow your beard and trim the mustache. Now, this is mentioned here, there's an asterisk beside it. Uh, this is a matter of, of some difference of opinion. Uh, the majority of scholars uh, say that it is, it is basically wajib, like a, a man has to grow his beard. That's the opinion I personally go with. However, there's an opinion in the Shafi'i Madhab that says, you know, it's a sunnah mu'akkadah and it's not farid. So if somebody goes with that opinion, that's fine. So for this reason, we say it is only highly recommended and not required, right? For a man to grow the beard and trim the mustache, but still something highly, highly recommended. And we do encourage our brothers to, to, to do that. Uh, be presentable and professional. This is important. So if somebody shows up to the Dawah booth wearing pajamas, like, like I'm talking pant pajamas and a t-shirt, is that Islamically okay? Yes, it is, right? Is it Islamically, is it Sharia compliant? You're covering your aura, it's loose, that's fine. But is it presentable and is it professional? No, it's not. And something we want to encourage, you know, my, myself first and foremost, when we come to the booth, we should try to have some level of professionalism, right? It's not like, a, like, it's not like teenagers hanging out in a corner Right, but it's it. You know, you should try. We should try to have some level of professionalism. You'll notice that when companies like BMW, Mercedes, uh, you know, uh, and anybody who any respectable company that has some sort of 
informational booth or table, usually, usually um, they dress somewhat elevated, right? And that is what we are expecting from, from ourselves as well, because we are inviting people to Islam, right? So we should be trying to, to dress a little bit more, not formally, it's not business, but, you know, dress it up a, a little bit. And what does that mean? So, for example, don't come uh, very, don't dress very informally laid back. So don't come in a tank top, right? Don't wear sweatpants, right? Um, and don't wear tight clothing like skinny jeans. So let's like basically we're just trying to elevate it a little bit when we're at the dawah booth, right? Um, other than that, it's pretty fair game for brothers. You want if you want to come in a suit, you're more than welcome to. If you want to come in a, in a thobe and a topi, you you can come in that. Uh, if you want to come in, I don't know, you know, just like jeans and a t-shirt, that's fine as long as it looks you know presentable, you know, professional. That that all that's all that's good. For the sisters, uh, the dudes are wear Sharia compliant clothing, obviously. Uh, dress modestly, same thing for men, and be presentable, right? Same thing, like, you know, even though you might have an abaya that covers covers everything, but if it has, like, if it's, like, really dirty or ripped and stuff like that, obviously, these are things to, to keep in mind. Uh, do not dress very informally, laid back, same thing with the brothers. Do not show hair, neck, ears, bosom. Uh, do not wear visibly tight leggings, and do not wear makeup and perfume, okay? All of these things based off the Quran and Sunnah, and or Sunnah. Uh, so that's pretty much our dress code policy. Does anybody have any questions about this? CK, good, Tamam. Okay. And Alhamdulillah, like one thing personally, and 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 um, you know, I mean, I'm not going to shy away from this. I mean, you guys have. Many of you guys have seen what has, you know, transpired recently related to this. Um, I personally, like, alhamdulillah, I'll just share a brief story. I just came back from Hajj, alhamdulillah. And when I was in the Haram, like, it, honestly, I saw, you know, there were like, you know, a million people doing Hajj. But when I was in, in actual Mecca, Mukarrama, you're in the Masjid, Mukarrama, and you're in the Masjid, and you see people, different skin colors, different languages. I, I, was, I was hearing languages I've, I've never heard before, or it sounded like I've never heard them before. But the clothing that I saw was just remarkable. Like, subhanAllah, it was like a halal fashion exhibition. Uh, you see different colors, different textures, you know, different, different styles, subhanAllah. And that, that to me is really beautiful. When, when people from different backgrounds, different cultures, etc., come together, you know, under Tawheed, under worshiping the oneness of Allah, worshiping Allah in, in, in his oneness. But we all are different in so many other ways, right? So Alhamdulillah, I, I like seeing that at, at the booth as well. Um, I personally, when I come to the booth, I, I try to dress um, like an average Canadian, uh, just because I feel like, you know, that's, that's what the, you know, that's what the people of our society wear. So that's kind of what I want to wear as well. Uh, because at the end of the day, I feel like, you know, I'm Canadian, uh, you know, I speak English, uh, but, you know, our religion is different, right? And inshallah, they can also be like us, uh, and all they have to do is just change their, their aqidah, essentially, right? So, anyways, if that's clear, inshallah, we'll move on. And if any questions come up later on, there's going to be a Q&A at the very end, uh, but I was hoping to leave that more for, you know, discussion about uh, dawah. Uh, Somebody said it also makes you more approachable and relatable, maybe. That's also, to be honest with you, that's also one of the reasons why I do it, right? Um, now, and, and no offense to anybody, but, you know, I, I want to appear, um, I guess you could say, you know, more like, more like, more, uh, more, is it, yeah, I guess you could say more approachable, right? And that's not to say that somebody who's not wearing that is not approachable, but just, you know, I just want to make it seem like, hey, this guy is just like us, but he's just religion is different, right? And yes, he has a beard, but his religion is different, right? So, jazakum Allah. Okay, wa astaghfirullah wa atubu So, can you guys still, can you guys see the, are we back to the PowerPoint? Can you see that? You see what does dawah mean? Yes, okay, tana. So now, what does dawah mean, Okay. And then, inshallah, we'll, we'll have a break in about 20 minutes if you guys need it. Uh, otherwise, we may just continue through. So, what does da'wah mean? Uh, da'a yad'u means uh, inviting, right? Uh, da'wah, inviting others to Islam, missionary work, okay? Missionary work. So, pretty much, we are inviting uh, others to Islam. We are literally, you know, doing missionary works. And, and I'm not shy to say that. 
And as I said before, when I was living in Canada before going to Japan, I would always, always see like Jehovah's Witnesses, Christians, you know, doing their dawah. But I never saw Muslims doing it. And when I learned that Islam is in fact the truth from Allah, I was like, why don't we do our dawah, right? So uh, that's pretty much what it is. Very simple. You're inviting others to Islam, okay? Now, four principles that every day you must know. These are very, very important, okay? Uh, and we're going to go through each of these uh, one by one, and then I'm, I'm, there's going to be a summary of them at the end. Number one, only Allah can guide people, and then there's going to be slides for each of these, so I'm just going to summarize them now. We must use wisdom, good instruction, kindness, and logic. We must never get discouraged, and if you don't know, say, I don't know. Okay, so these four principles, if you can keep them in mind, they will, inshallah, help us a lot in da'wah. Okay, number one, we need to understand, brothers and sisters, that only Allah can guide people. I know sometimes we're really hyped. We watch, for example, like uh, before Sheikh Uthman, uh, Hafidahullah, I used to watch a lot of Dr. Zakir Naik videos, uh, you know, Sheikh Ahmed Didat, etc. And we used to think, oh my God, like now I, now I can answer everything. So therefore, like, you know, there's no reason why somebody shouldn't accept Islam. Okay. But it doesn't matter what you say to somebody. It doesn't matter what you say to someone. You need to understand that only Allah can guide people. This is clearly mentioned in the Quran where Allah Azza wa Jal says, Indeed, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you do not guide whom you like, but Allah guides whom he wills, and he is most knowing of the rightly guided. So if, if, if anybody could guide somebody that they wanted, it would have been Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But even he cannot guide whom he likes to be guided, right? So we need to keep this in mind. And for me, when I'm going dawah, when I go to dawah, to be honest with you, I never think about, oh, like, oh, let's get a shahada, let's do this. I, I don't really think about that, okay? I only think I am going there for the sake of Allah. And if Allah wants to grant us shahada, that's great. If he doesn't, that's also fine, right? Because your niyyah should be to invite others for the sake of Allah, not to have like, uh, you know, another, another tick on, uh, you know, like, uh, it's not like a badge. Oh, this many people took their shahada with me, right? It's not like a badge. So um, that's our intention. And that's what we need to understand that we cannot guide anyone. <clears throat> only Allah can guide people. Okay. Our duty is only to remind. Okay, and there's many examples of this in the Quran, Fadakir, uh, and this is, uh, I believe, from uh, the end of Surah Al-Ghashiyah. Lista alayhim bi right? You are not over, you are not a dictator over them, right? Uh, you are not a dictator over them, so remind you are only one who reminds. So and, uh, Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent as a bringer of good tidings and as a warner, right? So he is one who reminds, and we also do the reminder. We are not authorities over people. Right, we are just reminders essentially, and Allah guides whom He wills. Okay, so that's number one. In summary, we need to make sure that we understand that only Allah can guide whomever He wills. So, even if you've memorized the entire Bible and you're coming to the Dawah booth and you can recall verses off the top of your head, it doesn't mean you can guide anybody. Okay, it doesn't mean you can guide anyone, even if you watch all of Dr. Zakir Knight's videos and memorize them and have a transcript of each. Right? It doesn't mean you can guide anyone. This is what we need to understand. Only Allah can guide people. And I'll just say this from my personal experience, and, and other people can, can testify to this. The people who I've witnessed their shahada, there's never been any debate. There's never been debate. It is you tell them, this is what we believe. And they say, yes, I believe this. Yes, I believe this. I say, oh, are you Muslim? He's like, no, I, I don't know if I am or not. Okay, would you like to become one? Yes. There's no debate because we know that uh, every newborn is born upon the fitra of Islam, which is the belief, the innate belief in the oneness of Allah. So essentially, we do not guide anyone. It is Allah who guides people. We are just basically a means. We're like a pipe. We're like a pipe. That, an analogy is like we're like a pipe that Allah chooses to send water through essentially. But if, if Allah doesn't choose to send the water through, you could be a dry pipe your whole life, right? But that's essentially the analogy, okay? So number two, this is extremely, extremely important, and it's going to be repeated. 
Okay, use wisdom and good instruction. ادعوا إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجد وجدلهم بالتي هي أحسن إن ربك هو عالم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو عالم بالمهتدين. Invite to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good instruction and argue with them in a way that is best. Okay. So Allah doesn't say ادعوا إلى سبيل ربك بالعلم with with knowledge. Now of course knowledge is important. At least not in this verse. Okay. He's saying with wisdom. Some of you guys, many of you guys have seen that guy named Michael, uh, who is a Christian preacher who's been at Surrey Central uh, for, for a number of years, uh, almost as long as, no, we, I think we were there. I don't know who came first, <laughs> but uh, I'm pretty sure we were there before him. And somebody correct me if I'm wrong. But anyways, there's another uh, Chinese preacher at Metrotown. I've had, it, sadly, a discussion with both of them. Um, and... Uh, actually, with Michael, more than one, uh, and, and not myself, I, I, pretty much many of us have, Brother Ari, Brother Zayan, and, and many different people, and it doesn't really turn out good. Now, just as an example, their dawah is as follows. They have a sign, they have a sign, and they say, for example, on their sign, it might say, you know, the people who are condemned to hell, it says rapists, pedophiles, drug dealers, prostitutes, blah, 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 all these things, right? Um, and he's on his mic, and he's like kind of like yelling at people, Right? I don't think any of you guys would agree that that is inviting to people with wisdom. Whereas if you compare it to our booth, alhamdulillah, we have signs set up. We have a table with books on it. We're standing in front of our booth. Sometimes, of course, we stand behind, but it's better to stand in front. And we are just kind of smiling and inviting people to have a conversation. Right. So I would say that is a lot more wise than the other approach. Right. So we invite with wisdom. And what exactly is wisdom? compared to knowledge. Wisdom, in a nutshell, is knowing what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. Knowing what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. Okay? So, there's many examples of this, but basically, I think many of us know that in life, generally, it is not about what you say, but it's about how you say it. And anybody who's married, I think, understands this. Right? For example, uh, you know, the, the, the biryani might have been a little bit too salty, right? So instead of saying, what is this? It's too salty, right? You might say <clears throat> something along the lines of, let's see, how would you say this in a nice way? Maybe I need you guys' help. Um, how would you say that the biryani is too salty in a, in a way with hikmah and gentleness? I'm going to ask you guys this. How? Feel free to unmute yourself or type. How would you tell your wife, right, or husband, that the biryani is too salty in a gentle way? Biryani is blessed with extra salt. <laughs> biryani is blessed with extra salt. Okay. Subhanallah. One. Okay. Here's one. Here's one. Who's one that I thought of? Okay. You would say Habibti or, or, you know, honey or husband or whatever, whatever you call your, your spouse. Did you, did we buy like a different salt this time? Did we buy a new salt? This is like a new brand of salt. So it kind of has like a different taste. Maybe it kind of, it almost tastes a little bit saltier. So do you guys, do you guys see the difference there? Instead of saying, this is so salty. What are you doing? Versus saying, you know, oh, did we change the salt? And then they might get the hint. Uh, <laughs> you must be so much in love in love with me. Yeah. And then they get the hint that the biryani is too salty. So going back to dawah now, um, when we're giving dawah, it is very important that we are delivering the message in a way with wisdom. And, and wisdom is not something that you can necessarily learn. Some people have it more than others, right? It's something you can develop, but some people have it more than others. And they say it develops with age, right? So we ask Allah Azza wa Jal, we should make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal, that he, he makes his da'is with excellent wisdom. Allahumma ameen. Okay. Now, wisdom and good instruction, as we highlighted. Now, when talking to Jews and Christians, as a general rule, um, and do not argue with the people of the scripture, except in a way that is best, except for those who commit injustice amongst them. Among them, and say, we believe in that which was revealed to us, uh, in that which has been revealed to us and revealed to you, and your God, uh, and our God and your God is one, and we are Muslims in submission to him. This is from Surah Al-Ankabut. So when it comes to um, uh, Christians and Jews, 
usually when I start the conversation, we don't start with the differences. We start with the, the similarities, right? Say, oh, okay, you guys are Christian. Okay. And usually something I might say, for example, when speaking to a Christian, I'd say somebody who's actually Christian, like a conservative Christian, I might say, well, you know what? Like, you know, it's, it's, I might say something like, you know, it's not every day you find people who even believe in God anymore. Right. And then that kind of starts the conversation, right? Now you're talking about the existence of God, right? And then it might lead to other places. Uh, but, you know, usually we, we start in a, in a very gentle and light way, um, but we still convey the message. And we're going to talk about that later on. But generally speaking, I, I've said these words directly myself. I tell Christians this when I'm giving da'wah. I, I say this like almost by, by quoting it. So I say, we believe in that which has, has been revealed to us and revealed to you. And our God and your God is one. And to him, we are Muslims in submission to him. Now, for some Christians, they might be shocked by this. They might say, oh, you guys worship, you know, you believe our God and your God is one. Because some believe that we worship like a moon God, right? Which is absolutely not true, right? So this verse clearly highlights similarities. We believe in that which has been revealed to us and revealed to you. And our God and your God is one. And we are Muslims in submission to him. Now, there's going to be a section at the end where we talk about how to talk to Christians and Jews. And I want to leave that maybe for, for more discussion. So we'll continue, inshallah. Uh, a key message from the time of Moses. Now, Musa, alayhi salam, we know, was sent to Pharaoh, who is, is a, you know, one of the worst, if not the worst human being to ever walk this earth. Okay? Okay? And we need to understand something. When Allah sends Musa and Harun to Pharaoh, he tells them something very amazing, as you guys all know. So say to him, right? Perhaps he will be reminded, right? He may be reminded or fear Allah. So if it comes to the worst human being or one of the worst human beings to ever walk this, this earth, and this is a person who has said, who called themselves, I am your Lord, the most high. He called himself the Lord, the most high. I've never met anybody in Canada or anywhere who has ever thought that they were actually God, let alone call themselves Allah the Most High. So if Allah ordered Musa and Harun and Aaron to, alayhim salam, peace be upon them, to speak to, Mo, uh, to speak to Pharaoh in a gentle way, then what about the average Canadian? What about the average, you know, as Dr. Zachary Knight says, Tom, Dick, and Harry, right? What about the average person, Right. So we should definitely be speaking qawlan layinan. Now qawlan layinan, qawl means uh, speech, layinan means lenient. And here it's it translated as uh, gentle. Gentle uh, is, is a better translation. Uh, and speak with him gentle speech. So again, the message here is if, if, if Musa and Harun alayhim salam were ordered to speak a gentle word with Pharaoh, then what about everybody else? So we should definitely be speaking uh, kind, gentle words with the people of Suri and beyond, okay? Now, message number three, uh, rule number three, sorry, some people will never, will never listen. Some people, no matter what you say to them, they will never, ever, ever become Muslims. I'll give you an example. And I think, uh, I remember Sister Hebo was there, my wife was there that one day, we went to Vancouver, and I maybe Brother Adnan was there as well. Anyways, so we were giving dawah uh, at uh, Main Street Science World area, and there was this one guy, and he literally said this. He literally said this. He first came and he thought he was atheist. And then later after our discussion, he realized he's not really atheist. He's more agnostic, right? Uh, but anyways, he said, he said, even if God were to come down right now, even if God were to come down right now, I still wouldn't be 100% certain. I still wouldn't 100% believe in him. So, so some people will never listen. And this comes directly from the Quran. Indeed, those who disbelieve, it is all the same for them. Whether you warn them or do not warn them, they will not believe. And this, this message appears different times in the Quran. So, so this message appears different times in the Quran. So some people, no matter what you say to them, they'll, they'll never believe. They will never believe. So we need to keep this in mind. And again, it's good to come with enthusiasm and passion, but just realize some people, no matter what you say to them, they're not going to be believers, no matter what. 
Okay, Allah is the one who guides people, not us. Allah is the one who guides people, not us. And one more time, Allah is the one who guides people, not us. Okay. Okay. Number four, if you don't know, say, I do not know. Uh, now, question came up in the incident you just described. How would you, re how would you react? Now, it really depends on the, the situation, your, the type of relationship you've developed with this person. Um, if I remember correctly what I said to him, I kind of confronted him. I was a little bit more direct with him. Now, why? Because him and I kind of built a rapport already. We've kind of built, I don't want to say a friendship, but we've kind of built a rapport. How did I do this? Because I found out he used to live in, in White Rock, where I, I live like pretty much in White Rock. And I found out he used to live in like actually a specific neighborhood, which is one of the wealthiest uh, postal codes. And I don't live there, but anyways, he used to live in one, of the, in one of the neighborhoods with the wealthiest uh, postal codes in all of BC, right? Uh, and so I asked him about that. And then he's kind of smiled. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's right. Or something like that. So him and I kind of developed this relationship where we were more comfortable with each other. So when I, when he said that, I was like, come on, seriously? Like, even, even if that were to happen, you still wouldn't believe? And then I, I think if I'm not, if I'm remembering correctly, I might've said something like, well, don't you think like, and then I was like, like, then what's the point? Um, I might've even I said something like, then, then like, you know, where do you go from here? Essentially is what was my message. Like, where do you go? If somebody admits that even if they saw all the signs, they still wouldn't believe, where do you go from there? Right? So that's, that's kind of, uh, that was my response. And, um, but again, it really depends on the, you know, your conversation, the type of rapport you're developing with the person. Some people, you know, you can say things to some people that you can't say to others, right? So it really depends, right? And that's where you use your wisdom to judge what is the right thing to say and what's not the right thing to say, right? Lastly, this is very important. If you don't know, say, I don't know, right? So basically, uh, and we, we set not before you except men to whom we revealed our message. So ask the people of the message if you do not know. So as Muslims, we are encouraged to ask when we do not know. You might be asked like a detailed question or something you've never like uh, heard of before. Uh, it definitely happened to me. So, so uh, basically just say you don't know, right? What we all know, however, what we all know, however, which is something that people in Canada need is Tawheed. We know Allah is one. We know that Islam is the truth. We know that the Quran is the final revelation from Allah, Azawajal, right? We know these things and they do not. So we need to convey these things. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, بَلِّغُ عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً convey it on my behalf even if it, it was one verse one verse and this is what actually encouraged me to give dawah at the beginning like i'm obviously still learning i still consider myself a student of knowledge to some extent um but even at the beginning when i had less knowledge than i have now i still gave dawah because i know the basics right i know allah is one i know he doesn't have a son right i know he sent messengers to every nation so these things uh, if you know that, inshallah, you know, depending on the situation, you could give dawah, right? Uh, but sometimes somebody may ask, like, okay, like, um, uh, I don't know, like, who said, for example, you might, you'll probably never get this question, but if somebody asked, like, can you name me four scholars that have said that ni niqab is, is wajib, right? Who said that you must wear the niqab or some? I, I would say, I don't know. I really don't know, right? I, I, I'm Abu Hanifa from what I understand, but I, I can't name you more than that, right? So anyways, um, uh, so that, that's that. So I think that's straightforward. Now, in summary, only Allah can guide people. <clears throat> we must use wisdom, good instruction, kindness, and logic, and never get discouraged. And as we've said, why? Because only Allah can guide people. Some people, oh yeah, because only, some people will not believe no matter what you tell them. And if you don't know, say, I don't know. Okay. Uh, any questions about these points? Pretty straightforward. Okay. So what we'll do is, um, yeah, I think what we'll need is, okay, why don't we take, inshallah, like a five-minute break? We'll take a five-minute break. It's 
We'll continue at 11.02. And the reason is because next, the next slide is a different section. So we'll come back at, uh, sorry, 12.02. And then we'll continue from there, inshallah. Okay. So we'll just take a five minute break and then we'll come back at uh, 12.02. Jazakumullah khair. And if anybody has any questions about these, uh, in the meantime, feel free to ask.
Okay, uh, let's continue, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So I'm gonna keep the camera on until we start, oh, hopefully we won't lag, but <laughs> anyways. So these are the four principles where we left off. Let's continue, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So prophetic da'wah objectives, what are our goals? Okay, what exactly is our goal when we're giving da'wah? Okay. Conveying the message of Islam with clarity. Okay, that's, it's very important. Number one, so that's number one. And calling people to Islam, also, uh, obviously, also very relevant. Now, these two are very similar. What do we mean by conveying the message of Islam with clarity? Um, sometimes in trying to, like, please people or trying to not put them off, um, we might try to be, you know, go, like, a, take a very, like, a huge detour around what Islam actually is. Right? So, you know, we might use different words like, you know, purpose in life and, and you know, like, um, you know, a path or something like that. But, you know, and of course it is, it, Islam does give you a purpose uh, in life. It does offer a path to live your life, but it's, it's, it's a religion because we believe in Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, and we believe in revelation and we believe in prophethood. So it is a religion. So our job, our job when we are giving da'wah is to basically convey the message of Islam with clarity. We don't have to change the message of Islam. We don't have to water it down. We just say what Islam is using hikmah. And obviously our objective is to invite people to Islam. Uh, and this is going to come up afterwards, but Ask a Muslim specifically focuses on non-Muslims. You know, like for example, um, an example you guys might, you will know, like for example, uh, uh, Jama'at Tablighi, Tablighis, right? When they're doing their da'wah, they are inviting, they are inviting, uh, Muslims, right? I remember when I was younger, I, I would I would sometimes have these brothers show up at the door. I didn't really understand. I didn't know at the time that you know they were doing tabligh, uh, but they would show up, and I'm like, Subhanallah, like these people are coming. Uh, these people are coming to my door, right? Um, and Alhamdulillah, they're telling me to come to the masjid, which is obviously good. Uh, but you know, were they also calling the non-Muslims? I wasn't sure, right? So for us, we focus on inviting non-Muslims to Islam and calling people to Islam. That is our goal. Now, and, and the, the verse from the Quran is Surah uh, chapter 21. Uh, yeah, sorry, Surah, uh, yeah, Surah chapter 21. We have never sent a messenger before you, O Prophet, without revealing to him. There is no God worthy of worship except me, so worship me alone. Okay? So very clear. Uh, we, we also, one of our goals is to bring glad tidings and warnings to people. So we shouldn't shy away from speaking about Jannah and hellfire, right? We can say that we believe in, a, in, a, in an afterlife. We, we believe in reward and we also believe in punishment, right? And some people don't like, like you'll notice some of the Christian preachers, they never talk about hellfire. But hellfire is a reality. And Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ um, uh, la ilaha Allah. Uh, in, in meaning, Allah says, you know, Bashira uh, wa We've sent you as a bringer of good tidings and as a warner, right? So we also give people good tidings. We tell them, hey, there's a reward, you know, for people who believe and do good. And we also warn them about a hellfire. And sometimes when people are like, you know what, I need some time before I take the shahada, I need some time. I say, look, I don't want to pressure you. Right? I don't want to pressure you to take your shahada when you're not ready. At the same time, this is a pretty serious matter that you should be prompt in. You should be pretty haste uh, in doing this because if you die uh, before that, you could be in a, you know, in a very dangerous position, right? And, and depending on your situation, you would be in a dangerous position, right? So um, that is, these are our objectives when giving da'wah. Uh, and we do not send messengers except as deliverers of good news and as warners, okay, very clear. I think that's all pretty straightforward. Uh, any questions about this before I move on to the next section? <clears throat> These are our goals when giving dawah. And, you, and we're going to go into more detail later on. The, the end of the, uh, of the workshop is a lot more detailed. These are more you know, foundational, theoretical uh, you know, concepts. OK. What are the qualities of a da'i? So what qualities should a da'i have? Number one. Uh, firm knowledge. Okay. Now you don't ha you don't have to be a scholar to give dawa. You do not have to be a scholar to give dawa. And in fact, in fact, sometimes 
you know, not to undermine any scholar, but, but you know, knowledge alone is not the criteria for being a good da'i, right? Knowledge alone, because somebody could have, uh, you know, be a hafiz of the Quran, memorize a bunch of hadith, uh, memorize, uh, studied fiqh, studied a bunch of things, but if they're really, if they have really poor mannerism, if they, um, you know, the way they talk to people, it kind of pushes people away from the booth, right? That's not wisdom, right? And that is not the way of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, okay? Um, now, a good start is knowing kind of the six pillars of belief. What do, what do Muslims actually believe in? And we all believe in these things. You may not know the six pillars in that, uh, you know, uh, in that label, under that label, but we all know we believe in, for example, Allah, the oneness of Allah, the existence of Allah, uh, angels, books, uh, you know, um, the decree of Allah, heaven and hell. We believe in these things, right, as Muslims. And the five pillars of Islam, we also believe in these things. So, so we know the foundations, right? And as I've said, you know, even if you are conveying, even if you're conveying one verse, right, that could be, that could be enough to invite, uh, to bring somebody into the folds of Islam. And we need to remember that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't start da'wah after receiving all the revelation, okay? And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he didn't start da'wah, you know, after being years and years and years as a Muslim, right? He started his da'wah right away, right? So alhamdulillah, as long as you know that Allah is one, you know the basics of Islam, you don't have to be a scholar or a faqih, somebody who's very versed in fiqh to be a da'i. At the same time, you can't be a, a jahil, right? You can't be somebody who's ignorant and, you know, who thinks that, you know, what's an, a salah is not farid, something like that, right? So you, you can't be somebody who's ignorant, right? And we should avoid, we should generally avoid, you know, questionable slash inauthentic information, right? So some things like, some things that are either based off fabricated hadith, um, you know, using daif hadith is a different discussion, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a whole nother discussion, but um, using fabricated hadith, using cultural beliefs, avoid that, right? Uh, avoid that when you're giving da'wah because we don't want people to come and become Muslims learning a, a, a cultural version of Islam. And then when they learn the real Islam, they realize that, whoa, like that's so different from the culture. And that was it for me. Like when I started studying Islam in more detail, I realized so many of these beliefs you grew up believing or are part of your culture are not actually founded in Islam, okay? So that's number one, knowledge. Number two, insight and respect. Obviously you should be somebody who's uh, respectful, right? That's a, that's a given. You're inviting people to Allah Azza wa Jal. You should be somebody who's good mannered, respectful. Uh, you know, that's why we said presentable, professional. You should be, you should be looking good and being good, right? Um, we need to understand that every person's background uh, is different and we need to share what is beneficial to that person. So if somebody's an atheist, you're not gonna start telling them like about why their belief in Jesus is incorrect because they, they, they don't even believe in Jesus in that way that Christians do, right? So uh, what's, the analogy is like a medical dawa approach. When you see a good doctor, they diagnose you and then they give you, and then they give you, you know, a prescription. In the same way, when somebody comes up to you and, you know, you first learn, like, where do they stand? Like, are they an atheist? Are they Sikh? Are they, are they Hindu? Are they Christian? What do they believe in before you can give them, before you can determine how you're going to speak to this person? Because obviously my discussion with an atheist is going to look very different than my discussion with a Christian. Okay. I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, th these two are very important. Offending others uh, doesn't lead, usually the outcome is not, not, almost always the outcome is not good, okay? Offending others. I actually can't think of an outcome where offending somebody is actually a good thing. Um, so we don't want to basically be rude or disrespectful, obviously. Um, you want to avoid debates. Now, this, I need to say something here. I know a lot of us get maybe inspired to do dawah when we watch like, you know, uh, Sheikh Othman or, or Dr. Zakir Naik and Sheikh Ahmad Didat, etc. We need to understand. So there's two things. Number one, Sheikh Ahmad Didat and Dr. Zakir Naik, they are, they are even, they're different than what we do. Okay. Why are they different? Because Dr. Zakir Naik, in most of his videos, he has the entire platform and he's speaking and other people can only ask questions at the very end. That is not how our dawah is set up. Our dawah is a conversational dawah. So it's back and forth. It's not one way. And Sheikh Ahmad Didat, 
uh, may Allah have mercy upon him, I mean, he was engaged in debates, right? And that's also not what we're doing because it's not like, you know, at the Dawah booth, we're having time debates and you get five minutes and I get five minutes and then we're going to have a rebuttal round. It's not like that. So if we think we're going to apply what we saw on YouTube to bring it right to the Dawah booth, then we are mistaken. Right, we we're not we're not and yeah we are basically mistaken. Okay, the other thing is let's take Sheikh Osman's example or Hyde Park or other things. You know, debating right, debating. We have to understand, brothers and sisters, and I say this very bluntly. YouTube is driven by views. YouTube is driven by views. Okay, it's not driven by sincerity to Allah. It's not driven by. I'm not saying anything about anyone in general. I'm just I'm just telling you what what's like the you know, is there an ikhlas counter on YouTube? Obviously not, right? It's, it's, it's how many views did this, this, this view get? So YouTube is driven by views. So what I'm saying is when it comes to uh, the types of videos that are posted, when it comes to the thumbnail, when it comes to the title, when it comes to, you know, uh, when and when and where it's posted, all of these things, all of these things are driven by the underlying, you know, uh, motive behind YouTube, which is to get views, right? So if we're thinking that, okay, we're going to apply the dawah that we see on YouTube to our dawah booth, I also think you're mistaken, right? Because the reason is we are not driven by views with Ask a Muslim. We are not. We are driven by, by I'd like to think we are driven by the taqwa of Allah and sincerity, right? And I'm not saying anything against any da'i. I'm not saying anything against anyone. I'm not saying they're not sincere. I'm not saying any of that stuff. I am just saying that YouTube is often like a, it's almost like in some ways, almost entertainment, right? Whereas the dawa that we have is not always entertainment. Like for example, I'll give you a very simple example. Let's say somebody comes up to me and this happened, this happened different times. Somebody comes up to me and tells me his son died from overdose. Okay. His son died from overdose. And now I'm here trying to comfort this person, trying to tell them that this life has a meaning, trying to tell them that God created this life as a test. I want to ask you a question. Do you think that if this conversation was filmed, it would, uh, it would go uh, viral on YouTube? I don't think so. Because I, I was there, I saw the conversation. The guy was very sad, right? And it, it was a very sincere moment. It was a very genuine moment. And what I'm, what I'm trying to say at the end of the day is, is when we do dawah, the number one thing we have to remember is to stay sincere to Allah. And number two, it's not, we're not trying to one up the other person. It's not a game of chess, right? So we need to make sure that we are being sincere and we need to basically do what is best for the other person, not for ourselves, right? Of course, we're doing what's best for ourselves because we're doing dawah for the sake of Allah. But what I'm saying is think of the person in front of you as a creation of Allah, right? Not, not like a, a, a means to get more views on YouTube or not, you know, not a means by which, you know, to, to become famous or whatever, right? So that is our approach. We have discussed on a side note, we have discussed filming uh, our Dawa interactions. This is something that came up. Um, I've, I've always had reservations against it. Um, and also there's obviously legal considerations involved as well. And uh, so at the moment, we do not film our, our, our DAO sessions. And the only time we would ever film is by getting the consent of, of somebody. So anyways, that's, that's a side note. Um, number three, <clears throat> the DAI should be uh, clear in his speech. So again, we're talking about the qualities of a DAI. What qualities should a, a DAI have? Um, they should give simple, understandable examples. And they should avoid unnecessary details. And they should leave an impact with the person. Okay? So... I'll give you a very simple example, okay? One time I was at UBC. UBC is different, but I'll, just as an example. One time at UBC, and let's say, for example, I start talking about, you know, uh, I'll give you an example. I'm talking to, let's not use UBC, for example. Let's use Surrey, Surrey Central, where we give our dawah. Let's say I go to Surrey Central and I'm start talking about, you know, uh, Thomas Kuhn and his book, the, the you know, uh, and he's talking about the paradigm shifts. And, you know, we need to understand the epistemic, epistemi <laughs> epistemology of, uh, of, you know, different things. And we need to understand the dichotomy between belief and non-belief. And we need to understand that all of these things have an underlying, you know, uh, you know, you know, foundation and all these things. If I start using a bunch of philosophical jargon and academic jargon, 
right? If I start using a bunch of these heavy words, do you think people are going to understand me? No, right? And I know this is another thing. I know sometimes on YouTube, we see guys using very heavy words, using philosophical arguments, using different things. But brothers and sisters, we need to understand the average person in Canada, from what I understand, from what I see of people, won't connect at that level. Maybe people in the UK and other places are different, right? But here in Canada, the average person, especially at Surrey Central, if you start bringing up, you know, uh, if you start, for example, start saying things like um, uh, infinite regress and temporal argument and this and that, you're going to lose people. You're going to lose people, right? So a da'i should be clear in his speech. That doesn't mean you can't use logic, right? That doesn't mean you cannot use logic. No, we use logic. But what I'm saying is when you're speaking to people, speak in their language. Anyways, uh, when you're speaking to people, speak in their language, okay? Speak in a way that they can understand. And all the prophets were sent basically with the language of the people, right? They were sent to speak in the language of the people so that they could be understood and they can understand others. So that is the note here. So a uh, da'i should uh, be somebody who is clear when they are speaking. Uh, last one is patience and self-control. A da'i should be somebody who is patient when they get opposed, when things get heated, when a person is being hurtful or harmful, and when there is no response, right? We should be patient. Uh, you, you might stand hours out there, right? Uh, you might stand out you know, in the street for hours and nobody comes to the booth. Or, you know, you get in a very heated argument with someone. It's happened. It's happened to me and others. And, you know, uh, almost everyone I know who's been given dawah, there's been, they've been in heated, you know, altercations. Alhamdulillah, the overwhelming majority of our discussions are not like that. Uh, they're definitely a minority. Um, but, you know, sometimes, you know, things happen and you need to be patient, right? We need to be patient. As Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu sta'inu bis sabri wa salah. Seek help through patience and prayer. Inna Allah sabirin. Indeed, Allah is with the patient, right? And Allah, wallahu yuhibbu sabirin. And Allah loves those who are patient, right? So, uh, so that is, you definitely need to have patience and self-control. You cannot let your ego get the best of you, right? You cannot let your ego get the best of you. And especially, I want a, a very tangible example is with Michael. Uh, and Brother Ari can testify this and others, uh, you know, this guy goes and says things that are just outright kufr in the extremest ways. He makes a mockery of Islam. He makes a mockery of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And, and he, he, he says things that are just incorrect and wrong. He even tried at one point to teach Brother Ari and I Arabic. And, and he, does, he can't even spell, from what I remember, he couldn't even spell the word properly. Anyways, so the point is, this guy, if you engage with him, it could increase him in the kufr statements that he says. So we have to be patient, right? If you're the kind of person who cannot handle an insult, if you're the type of person who is going to react violently, right? You, you need to control yourself because I'm telling you, this guy says things like sometimes he literally dedicates his time just to attacking Islam. He turns around, looks at our booth and he faces the other side and he starts, he pulls out his notes of, you know, these, these, uh, this information that he has and he starts, you know, attacking Islam. We don't, we ignore him. We ignore him. And our policy with Ask a Muslim is this guy we don't engage with. Don't talk to him. Even if he comes and stares at our booth, even if he comes and wants to have a conversation, no. The last thing I said to this guy, I said, don't talk to me until you can give me a chapter like the Quran. Give me a chapter, any, like any chapter of the Quran. Right? As, as I mentioned, Allah's challenge to humanity. I said, otherwise, don't talk to me. You claim to, be, you claim to know Arabic so well. Give me a verse. Give me a chapter like the Quran. Otherwise, don't speak to us. Right? So that's, that's my point. <clears throat> so Alhamdulillah, uh, Sister Mugi is saying yesterday we ignored him. He couldn't say anything and left. Alhamdulillah. So that's it. That's it. Allah is the one who guides to the truth and Allah is the one who makes the truth clear. And Alhamdulillah, one example of, of this is when, I mean, this, this guy that we're talking about, he's literally been attacked before physically. Alhamdulillah, none of us have ever been physically attacked, right? And just because, you know, that's a different discussion. But anyways, we've never been physically attacked for offending people, I would like to think. Um, this guy, one time there was a guy who came from the other side of the street where this Christian preacher is, and he came to our side. You know what he said to us? He said, you know, when I'm on that side, I just hear, you know, I just feel so, I hear so much like negativity, like, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to go there. 
right? He's like, I, I just hear negativity. I don't want to go there. I come here. I feel peace. I feel happiness. I feel positivity, right? He's, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but he says he, feel, he feels positivity. So that's the difference. That's the difference. And Alhamdulillah, inshallah, our message is even being conveyed more than his because Alhamdulillah, we have large signs that clearly convey the message of Islam. So anyways, those are the qualities of a da'i. Uh, and then, oh yeah, one, I think there's one more thing. Inviting Muslims and non-Muslims. Now, um, with our focus in Ask a Muslim, it is on non-Muslims. Our focus in Ask a Muslim is on non-Muslims. However, at the da'wah booth, many, many times Muslims come and we never turn them away. We're very happy to see Muslims. We invite them as well to become more practicing Muslims. And, and you know, we've had numerous cases where a person's like, you know, I was born in a family that wasn't that practicing and I want to become more practicing. Or I used to be practicing and I kind of went off the path. I want to become more practicing. Uh, there's many people who come and ask us for Qur'ans. So we give it to them. So our objective with non-Muslims is to invite them to the religion of Islam. And with Muslims is to keep them on Islam and strengthen their faith. So that is, that's pretty much, that's pretty much uh, our objective. But as an organization, we, are, we were founded to invite non-Muslims, you know, to Islam. Okay. But that doesn't mean that we do not, that doesn't mean that we repel Muslims from the booth. Uh, absolutely not. In fact, the total opposite. Okay. Uh, and as we mentioned, the last thing is constantly renewing your intention, right? We look forward to the reward and, you know, the, the best deeds, أَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَدْوَمُهَا The most, de the best deeds are those done regularly, even if they are few. Okay. So, um, as Muslims, we should basically be trying to be consistent. That's where consistency comes in, even if it's small. So when we first started, we were like, you know what? Even if we can do the Dao booth once a month, that's great. If we can't, you know, uh, you know, sorry, not if we can't. If we can do better than that, that's great. But no less than once a month. And alhamdulillah, we've been able to do that thanks to the help of, of numerous uh, volunteers and contributors, um, you know, uh, many others, including Brother Zayan and Brother Ari and, and you know, and Brother Naveed and and and. and, and the sisters, Sister Ida, Sister Muge, and, and many, many others. And I forgot, uh, and, you know, I can mention so many, Brother Abdullah and, uh, and uh, Brother Adil and, and Sharyar, and may Allah reward you all. I mean, and, and there's more than that. Um, so constantly renewing your attention. The intention is so, so important because as a general rule in Islam, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ And we're going to talk about that. It's going to come up. So how do we actually give da'wah? Okay, now how do we actually give da'wah? And this is where there's a video I want to show you after we just go over this slide. So how do I actually give da'wah? Number one is to purify your intention. This is extremely important uh, because if you're coming to the da'wah booth to try and, you know, show off or, you know, for personal satisfaction, this is important. Something that's often overlooked. You know, when I was younger, right, and when I had less knowledge, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm not a scholar, but when I had less knowledge than what I have now, I used to kind of want to talk about talk to uh, people about Islam just so I can kind of like show them that it's the truth so I can be personally satisfied. It was kind of like a, a intellectual stimulation, right? It's almost like it was like kind of like something I enjoyed doing, like a hobby, right? That's not a good intention to have. If your intention is there just to, so you can feel good or exercise your mind, that's not a good intention to have. Your intention should be for the sake of Allah and only for the sake of Allah. It doesn't matter if somebody takes the shahada or, 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 or doesn't. If somebody does or does not, it doesn't matter. Your intention should be there only for the sake of Allah. Now, how do you give da'wah? As we said, there's nothing I can tell you. There's no workshop on the planet, or at least one that I've ever heard of, that will go and tell you, oh, if a person says this, then you say this. And then if they say that, then you say this, like a map. We're not going to teach you what to say to people. We're going to give you the foundation. And then inshallah, you can use that foundation. And we can use that foundation to invite people to Allah in the best way, inshallah. So I want to introduce the Gorap method. And this is uh, introduced by Ira, uh, Aira. Now, what is the Gorap method? The Gorap method basically says this. And this is very important. I need your attention, brothers and sisters. The Gorap method basically says, Regardless of the question that a person asks you, they could ask you about why do women wear the hijab? Uh, uh, what is your belief? What is the Quran? What is this? What is that? Uh, you know, why, especially the why questions. Why do you pray five times a day? Why this? Why that? Regardless of the question that they ask you, your response, your response should include at least one of the following things. 
in order. Okay? God's existence, that's the G. Oneness of Allah, that's the O. Revelation is the R. And is the A. And a prophethood is the P. Okay? So what, this, what does this mean? For example, somebody comes up to you and says, you know, well, you know, you're, you know, you, you for example, you're, 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 either your head is uncovered, or you're wearing a baseball cap, but she's covering her head. Why, why do you guys do that? Why, why the difference between men and women? Right? So I might say something like, excellent question. Now, instead of, you know, sometimes when you listen, this is the, this is kind of not the issue, but this is the, the consequence of listening to, to, you know, to a lot of YouTube. You know, you might try to give the person a logical answer, right, to that question. So you might try to say, for example, like, oh, well, we see a woman as jewels. And so we try to preserve them. And we cover them up. You know, when you have jewelry at home, you know, you don't put it out on, on a glass case for everyone to see. You cover it up. Right. But is that the reason why we do it as Muslims? Not really. No, because then that implies that as Muslims, it almost it, in the mind of the non-Muslim, they might just say, OK, Muslims came together. They thought about, you know, oh, this is logical. So let's just make the woman wear hijab because we came up with it with our own logic. Now we're going to make it wajib. <clears throat> but that's not the case. So your answer should be something along the lines of uh, something along the following lines. Excellent question. You know, I completely understand, you know, like I can completely understand from your perspective, you know, how uh, it may uh, appear, right? When you see men uh, not covering their heads and women covering their heads. Um, let me, let me basically, um, let me tell you our perspective regarding this question. So I might say something like, first of all, you need to understand that as Muslims, and I would say, do you know what a Muslim is? I say, no. Well, a Muslim is somebody who follows the religion of Islam. Islam means, Islam is a religion, which means submission to the one creator. It has other meanings, but part of that meaning is submission. Okay. So part of that religion, we believe in one supreme God, one God who has sent revelation and messengers to humanity. Right. And the final messenger we believe in is Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And the final revelation is the Quran. Now, you follow me so far and you would say, yes, yes, yes. So we believe in one God, final prophet, Quran. I'd say, excellent. Now, because we believe that this is from God and because there is proof that it is from God. Now, I wouldn't go into the proof yet. I would just I would go back to the proof. Because we believe that it is proof from the one God. Right. Uh, because we believe there is proof that it is from the one God. We follow everything it says. Right. Logically, I mean, that, that makes sense. You know, if you believe it's from God, you're going to follow what it says, of course. So in this scripture, it tells us it gives us kind of like a guide for Muslim men and women to follow. Right. And we believe that God created men and women differently. And we can discuss that if you disagree with that. Right. We, can, we believe God created men and women differently. And accordingly, they have different rights and, and on obligations and rules. For example, you know, a man. Islamically is, for example, required to, to spend on, on his household, whereas a woman is not. And then I would go in, whereas a woman, she's allowed to wear gold, for example, and silk, whereas a man is not. So we have different rules and responsibilities and regulations. So part of these rules are rules that regulate that a woman must cover her head, right, out of a command from her creator, right? And, you know, uh, and that is basically the distinction. Now, our creator does offer, he does tell us uh, a reasoning behind it, and he says, that is more be that is more suitable, more appropriate that they be known as righteous women and not be harmed. So there is a reason mentioned in the scripture, but that's pretty much what our belief is. Now that would kind of be my answer in summary. You'll notice that Alhamdulillah, if our conversation ended right there, the person would leave knowing that we believe in Allah, right? We believe that Allah is one. I'm pretty sure I mentioned that, and we believe in revelation and prophethood. And he even leaves knowing the reason that's mentioned in the Quran behind the hijab for women. Okay. So that would be kind of my response. But the point is every answer you give, a person should leave at least knowing, at least knowing the first two, at least. Okay. That we believe in God, God's existence and the oneness of Allah. Okay. They should leave knowing that. And then if there's time, they're willing to listen. You can go into the other ones. Now let's watch a video by Brother Hamza. And I believe, yeah, so the audio is being shared. I, and if it's, I'm gonna just uh, turn off my camera so it doesn't lag. Okay. It's just a five minute video. Hopefully it'll, uh, I think you guys can, yeah, you guys can hear the sound. If it doesn't work, then I'll just send the link later on. Bismillah. 
in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. How to give dawah in two minutes? Okay, Sorry. we have two types of dawah, active and passive. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. How to give dawah in two minutes? Okay, we have two types of dawah, active and passive. Active dawah is when you're engaging in conversation, you ask people questions. Passive is when they ask you a question. Let's start with the passive. Okay. Excuse me, Abdullah, why do you have a beard? That's a very good question, John. Thank you for asking that question. Now, before I started to grow a beard, I had exactly the same question. And I realized in order for you to understand the answer, you have to understand the concept of Islam. Do you have some time? Let's do another scenario. Susan comes up to Aisha. Hi, Aisha. Why do you wear the hijab? That's a very good question, Susan. And before I started to wear the hijab, I had exactly the same type of question. And I realized in order for you to understand the answer, you have to understand the concept of Islam. Do you have some time? Let me just do this again. Hello, John. I'd like to know why you guys pray five times a day. You know, that's a very good question. In order for you to understand the answer, you have to understand the concept of Islam. You see where I'm going here, guys? I'm linking everything to the concept of Islam, regardless if you know the answer or not. And there's an important reason why. But let's start with the active, and then I'll get to the reason. Active Dawah. Say I'm holding a leaflet. Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, sir. Today we're talking about what's your goal? Oh, that's very interesting. Thank you for stopping and wanting to engage with me. You found that interesting. Well, so do I. And I've realized that in order for you to understand what's your goal in life, you have to understand the concept of Islam. You see what I've done? Even by asking him a question, I'm linking it to the concept of Islam. Now, why are we doing this? Because, brothers and sisters, our answers come from Tawheed, our answers come from our concept. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists, He is one, He deserves to be worshipped, the Qur'an is a miracle, it's His revelation, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is indeed the final Prophet. If we establish this concept as a truth, then whatever comes from truth is true. So when you explain to them the concept, then you've given them the foundation. Because brothers and sisters, there's no point just debating and having arguments all the time and trying to rationalize everything because everyone has a world view. It's like having glasses on. If my glasses are tinted green, I'm going to be saying, look at that building, it looks green. But if someone's glasses are tinted red, they're going to say, no, it's red. Then we're arguing, green, red, green, red. The only way for us to understand each other, we have to swap glasses or take them off. And this approach does that. It gives them the foundation, the glasses in which we wear to see the world, which is the concept of Islam. You show them that that's true, then whatever comes from truth is true. So remember, link everything to the concept. That's a very good question. In order for you to understand the answer, you have to understand the concept of Islam. Let me give you some tips though. Someone may say, I just want a yes or no answer. Yes or no, yes or no. I would humbly say, well, that's very interesting, but yes or no is not the answer. For example, what's your name? Yes or no. How many days in the week? Yes or no. What's your views on abortion? Yes or no. Yes or no doesn't represent the true answer. So if you're sincere, then you'll know you'd have to give me some time for me to explain the concept. So that's how I would deal with that contention. Another contention is someone may come up to you and say, I heard that you guys want to drink baby's blood. Now you're not going to respond by saying, well, that's a very good question. In order for you to understand the answer, you have to understand the concept of Islam. No, you don't do that because you're implying that we do drink baby's blood. In these type of questions, this is what I would do. Of course we don't drink baby's blood. Are you crazy? But in order for you to understand anything about Islam, you have to understand its concept. Do you have some time for me to explain this to you? 
I know in the begin, beginning I said two minutes, but that was in a way to get your attention and I really thought it would take me two minutes, but regardless, I, I, I think it's worth it. So follow this approach and uh, it's a very easy way of giving Dao. Salaam alaikum. Okay, so that was the uh, approach, Alhamdulillah, the Gora. I think it's pretty straightforward and I think it's, it's very, um, you know, beneficial uh, because at the end of the day, as the brother said, we don't, Hafidhullah, we don't get our rulings from logic, right? We get our rulings from wahyi and, and that is what we should be conveying to the people. Because, you know, if you try to rationalize it and try to say, oh, well, we fast because fasting is scientific and healthy, but then they'll think you're just kind of like, a, you know, like, a, like, you know, nutritionists who have come together to, to live this alternate lifestyle. But that's not what we are, right? We are people who believe in the oneness of Allah and, and who follow Islam. So, okay. Uh, any questions about this or anything that has come so far? Uh, we're going to go for another, inshallah, 20 minutes, and then we're going to break for an hour for Dhuhr and lunch, and we'll come back to conclude. Uh, at the very end, depending on how many questions there are, uh, we may finish early. Um, uh, but Alhamdulillah, I, I'd like to think, I know this is a lot of information, but inshallah, nothing is like too, too new, um, or at least not that many things are too, too new. Any questions about this or anything else? Assalamu uh, alaikum, brother Umar. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, akhi. Um, so yeah, uh, one question about the uh, G O R A P, right? Uh, it, it talks about the different aspect and whatnot. What, yes. One thing I was thinking about: How about the um, uh, afterlife? Like uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the main idea is I will need to be going back to God and then be accountable to what I have done in this world, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, could Could that be also part of the uh, conversation? Of course it can. And again, it really depends on, it really depends on, you know, the person, their beliefs, the context, how your conversation's going, the rapport. That's why I say like, when you come to a DAO workshop, like, you know, we can never expect, oh, these are all the answers. This is how you respond. Like, it's not like, mm -hmm. Siri, not like we're programming Siri, right? Or, or uh, whatever the Alexa is her name. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the Amazon one. But anyways, um, so it, it's just to give you the foundation. But of course, if you want to talk about revelation, you want to talk about other things that you think are, uh, are appropriate to talk about. And this is where wisdom comes in. This is hikmah, knowing what to say and, and what not to say, right? right? And as Brother Hamza gave the example, if somebody says, oh, do you drink baby's blood? You're not going to go with that, you know, template response and say, well, in order to understand anything about Islam, no, you're going to say, of course we don't, right? So you'd have to apply the foundations to the context, right? And that's where hikmah comes in. But yeah, absolutely. You can talk about the hereafter. Sure. Thank you, brother. Zakallah khair. Okay, now, okay, that's where we are. Now, proving the truth of Islam. This is important. How do we prove that Islam is the truth? Now, we are approaching the end of our, of our actual content. So if we can get this done by lunch, that would be great. And then when we come back, we can open it up. And I do want to have the discussion. I think that might be one of the most fruitful things. So I would strongly, uh, you know, uh, ask you guys uh, if you could stay till the very, very end. So let's get through this, inshallah. Proving the truth of Islam. How do we prove that Islam is the truth? First of all, we need to understand what Islam actually says. Islam makes the following uh, you know, uh, prepositions or claims or beliefs. That God exists. He is one and indivisible, indivisible. He sent prophets and revelations. And Prophet Muhammad is Allah's final messenger. So how do we prove this to non-Muslims? Because that's what we're inviting people to. So... Uh, God's existence, evidence for God's existence, okay? There's many things that we can say, but again, we want to speak to people in a very simple way that they can understand. It's still a fact that everything comes from something. We've never discovered, you know, self-making matter or, you know, random matter that pops out of nowhere, right? Everything comes from something. And some people say, well, that's a very simple argument. It is simple, but that's the truth a bridge, Wi-Fi, your computer, your glasses, your topi, whatever it is, right? Everything comes from somewhere, probably China, but it comes from somewhere, right? So the point is, you need to convey this to people. 
Because if somebody is saying that something comes from nothing, then they need to prove it to you, not you prove it to them. Right? Like, for example, um, very simple example. Let's take Surrey Central SkyTrain. Okay? If you look, you point to the person. Okay, you see the SkyTrain right there. You see the building. You see the, the platform. You see everything. You see the signs. You see the, the emergency rights. You say, okay, uh, do you think somebody made this? I say, of course somebody made that. I say, okay, what if I told you that nobody made that? An earthquake happened 5,000 years ago. And this SkyTrain uh, was slowly you know, put together with, with, with wind. And eventually there was an electrical system and you know, uh, fans and cooling system and all that. Would you believe me? Uh, they would say no. So if they are making the claim that God does not exist, then they need to explain where everything comes from. And alhamdulillah, the other thing is there's like an order to the universe, right? And laws of physics. So, and these are mentioned in the Quran. اختلاف الليل والنهار, alternating day and night. It's pretty amazing if you think about it, that on this planet, you go to bed at night expecting it to be day the next day. And in the daytime, you expect it to be night continuously, like, like it's consistent, right? That doesn't seem like something that would result out of two things randomly smashing together. And the example I give, I give is like, if you take two foldable chairs, you smash them together, right? Do, would you expect a perfectly revolving leather, you know, chair with, uh, with uh, heated seats and cooled seats? You wouldn't expect that, it's illogical. So the fact that we have alternating day and night, we have clouds that carry water to barren lands, Imagine if this was not the case. How would we get water from, from the sea and lakes to, to where we needed to go, right? Uh, we have underground reservoirs. We have a, the moon as an indicator of time. There's cycles of the moon consistently, right? We have the wind cycle. There's so many more signs that show you that there's an order to the universe and there are laws to the universe, right? And all of these things point towards the existence of Allah and again, if the atheist does not believe that, then they need to prove where everything comes from, not you. They need to prove it. Because what we're, what we're saying is the logical conclusion. What they're saying is illogical. And this is very important. Science does not support atheism. Some people say, well, I believe in science. I'm an atheist. Why? <laughs> Why? Because science does not support atheism. Because atheism states that God does not exist. It's a belief that God does not exist. Science has not disproven God. Science has not proven that God does not exist. And if anything, science points towards the existence of Allah. Science points towards the existence of Allah. And we're going to talk about this in the next slide with evolution and the Big Bang. Now, evolution comes up. Now, first of all, as Muslims, uh, you know, uh, we could do a whole halakha just on evolution. But in a nutshell, the theory of evolution states that humans, apes, every living thing, we all share a common ancestor. Some people think that the theory of evolution states that we came from monkeys. That's not what it says. It doesn't say that we came from monkeys. It says that we share a common ancestor. It's almost like we, um, it's almost like um, your cousins. It's almost like us and monkeys are cousins. They're not our parents. It's like we're cousins. So if you go back far enough, your grandma, grandpa is going to be the same, right? That's what they say. Now, with evolution, very simply, even if somebody were to accept everything that evolution says, including the fact that we are cousins with monkeys, that does not explain, that does not explain where the very first life form came from. The theory of evolution does not explain the origins of life. It does not. It only explains the diversity of life, why there's so many different animals and species, etc. It does not explain how the very first life form came to be. And it does not explain how it actually came to reproduce itself, right? Because for example, my phone, which is obviously designed, okay? Can my phone reproduce itself? No, it can't. So it's not like I just leave my phone under the sun and I expect two phones tomorrow, right? So uh, that's not how it works. So uh, we, asked the, we asked them, how basically, how do you explain the very first life form? That's a completely separate field of biology. So what I'm saying is evolution does not disprove God because you still need to explain where the very first life form came from and how it got the ability to reproduce itself, which they don't have a definite answer for. They don't have an answer for. 
okay? The other thing, uh, and by the way, with evolution as Muslims, we make it very clear, right? We don't believe in human evolution, right? The other things, there's, there's a discussion there, but where we make it, where we draw the line is we do not believe in human evolution and we don't want people promoting that. We do not say, oh, well, technically Adam was, was Adam really a human or was he a hominid or was he something else? No, 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 right? We, we don't go there. Adam was clearly a separate creation of Allah Azza wa Jal, and he wasn't even made on earth. He was made in Jannah, right? And, and so we, we draw the line there, right? And we don't want uh, our volunteers promoting that uh, because that's just incorrect. And honestly, science has not proven uh, at all that, uh, you know, we are cousins of these, uh, of these, of these apes, okay? Um, now, Big Bang. Uh, the Big Bang essentially states that uh, at, once, at one point in time, uh, billions of years ago or millions of years ago, everything was once... Uh, a joined entity, like something very small. It was all one, one thing. Everything we see was all one, smaller than the size of an orange. And then basically something, uh, something separated, something caused an explosion, okay? Now, was it really an explosion? But we know for sure that something caused something to separate, okay? What caused the Big Bang? They do not know. And there's over 15 different models explaining what caused the Big Bang. So the point is, if an atheist says, well, the Big Bang, you tell them the Big Bang, okay, what caused the Big Bang? And they'll say, well, this or that. They won't know. They won't know. And they'll say, no, you cannot say for, sure, for certain what caused the Big Bang. So you would tell them, is it possible that God caused the Big Bang? And they would have to say, if they are being genuine, and if they're being logical, then they would have to say yes. They'd have to say yes. It, it is possible. It is, it is a possible scientific conclusion that God right, caused the Big Bang. And that's what we believe. So the Big Bang does not support atheism. Evolution does not support atheism. We need to understand this. And I know that a lot can be said here, but just for the sake of summarizing, uh, I'm going to leave it at that, inshallah. Evidence for the oneness of God. Because now, okay, now they say, okay, well, I believe in God, but how do I know it's one and not 30 or 300, etc.? Okay. So what we say is the following. If you look at the world, there's a unison nature. There's, there's, everything is synchronized, right? And there's a unison nature of the world. Rain comes down, vegetation grows, wind cycle, right, right brain, left brain, digestive system, consistencies in orbit, food organism relationship, uh, uh, you know, our, our abilities being matched with um, the day and night. Imagine if you're on a planet that had like 36 hours of day and you couldn't sleep right, uh, uh, you know, and you'd be so tired, or it was all night, and you couldn't, like, live and, and do your things in the daytime, right, um, so the point is, there's kind of like a, there's a oneness to the world, there's a oneness, and if you look at the signs, you look out in the world, it shows you that everything came from one, because everything is so synchronized, right, imagine, imagine if you had, and this is what Allah mentions in the Quran, had there been other gods besides Allah in the heavens or the earth, both realms would have surely been corrupted. Okay, the heavens and the earth. Okay, so glorified is Allah, Lord of the throne, far above what they claim. If there was other than Allah, you know, we would have seen much corruption. You know, what if, what if for example, one, let's say, for example, somebody gives the example, what if one God wanted you to be a boy, another one wanted you to be a girl? Right, what if one God wanted you to be rich, another one wanted you to be poor? Right? So, so it doesn't work. It does not work. One has to be more powerful than uh, it, the, one in this analogy. In this analogy, it wouldn't work to have two all powerful beings. It wouldn't. Right? And we've seen what happens. We've seen the division and the war and the bloodshed that can happen when humans disagree. So, what about a creator? Right? What, if, what about if there were more than one God? SubhanAllah. Allah has not taken any son, nor has there ever been with him any deity. If there had been, then each deity would have taken what it created, and some of them would have sought to overcome others. Exalted is Allah above what they describe concerning him. We see this in human history, where a son might kill his father to become king, and somebody else might kill the, uh, him to become king. So we see this all the time. So subhanAllah, to say, if we see it in humans, like imagine, a'udhu billah, if there was more than one deity right? The corruption that would happen. So everything points to a unison, a unison being, one being, right? One creator, right? And we see this in the creation uh, of the heavens and the earth.
Okay, evidence for the truth of prophethood and revelation. Okay, the Quran. Now, some people here, we sometimes people like to go into different uh, reasoning, and we're going to discuss these. How do we know that Islam is the truth and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a messenger of Allah? How do we know? Not because you know Baba and Mama told us. It is because of the Quran. It is because of the Quran. The Quran is what Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam left behind, and and basically it is um, it is proof that Islam is the truth. It is proof. How do we know this? Because the Quran says, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, wa in kuntum fi raybin min ma nazzalna ala abdina, fatu bi suratim min mithlihi, wad'u shuhada akum min dun illahi in kuntum sadiqin." And if you are in doubt about what we have sent down upon our servant Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Then produce a chapter the like thereof and call upon your witnesses other than Allah if you should be truthful. So Allah presents a challenge to humanity saying, if you doubt this book, then produce a chapter like it. And then he says, But if you do not and you will never be able to, then fear the fire whose fuel is men and stones prepared for the disbelievers. So when, I, when, when my approach, when it comes to establishing that the Quran is the word of Allah, I say that the Quran is written at such a high level of power and eloquence that it cannot be matched by a human being. And this challenge was already made to people far more versed in the Arabic language than we are 1400 years ago and they were not able to do it. And this is and this further proves the, the, the Quran because Allah says, and you will never be able to. So this is how we know that Islam is the truth. Because the Quran cannot be reproduced by a human being or jinn. And if all the human beings and all the jinn were to come together, they cannot make the likes of the Quran. They cannot. So this is how we know that Islam is the truth. Now, if you compare it to other scriptures, and this will come up, if you compare it to the Bible, you compare it to, to the Guru Granth Sahib, you compare it to the Hindu scriptures, you compare it to others, you will see, you will see the difference in terms of the preservation, in terms of the power, the eloquence, in terms of the historical and scientific accuracy. You will see the difference by the will of Allah. Okay. Now, so we said the first one is produce a chapter like it. The second one, we said the Quran has zero contradictions despite being revealed over 23 years. Now, somebody might say, okay, well, the Quran has no contradictions, and I've heard this before. What if some, like J.K. Rowling, like I don't want to compare the Quran to a book about magic, but just to give you an example, what they, what they said. So, uh, Harry Potter, it, it, you know, it could have no contradictions in it. Does that mean that it's the word of Allah? No, obviously not. So, what we say is, you have to look at the, the situation. The Quran was revealed over 23 years. Now imagine if somebody was telling a lie, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, story by story, over 23 years. You don't think you would find a contradiction? Of course you would. Of course you would find a contradiction. Okay? And this is what Allah says in the Quran as well. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Do they not reflect? Then do they not reflect upon the Quran? If it was from any other than Allah, they would have found within it much contradiction or many contradictions. If you look at the Bible, filled with contradictions. Filled with contradictions. Right? The stories, the gospels, they do not line up when it comes to their stories, right? There are different versions. We don't even know who wrote them, right? And somebody said, just Google Harry Potter plot holes. There you go. So you don't even know, we don't even know who actually wrote these books. So this is just a very, and again, I'm just trying to be, for the sake of being concise, uh, I'm just trying to get through this. Um, but basically, there are no contradictions in the Quran, and this is how we know. Quran consistency historic and scientific consistency whatever is truth in history right it will be basically consistent with the quran 
Okay, so whatever is mentioned in the Quran, historically accurate, like for example, about the, the drowning of Pharaoh and how uh, Allah said he would preserve his, his body, right? So many examples of historically, of historic, basically, uh, historic consistency in the Quran and scientific consistency. Now, I'm going to conclude before our break on this point. I'm going to conclude uh, before our break on this point. A word of caution, okay? Now, historic consistency, there, there are obviously examples. You can just look, you, can, you guys can just look up uh, historical miracles, right, of the Quran. I don't like using that term. Well, in a way, the Quran itself, obviously the Quran itself is a miracle and it's from Allah. So obviously we'd expect it to be accurate. Uh, we know it to be accurate. When it comes to scientific miracles, okay, we need to be careful here. Some, some of our brothers and sisters, and I used to be one of them, <laughs> Um, they, they try to assert the truth of Islam by saying that science says this, the Quran said this 1400 years ago, therefore this must be from Allah. I would not advise you to take that approach because science, anybody who studied the philosophy of science and the history of science knows that science constantly goes through changes. And in fact, one of the most cited books on the philosophy of science by Thomas Kuhn. It talks about different paradigms. So basically different beliefs or lenses that science goes through. At one point we thought the earth was the center of the universe. We no longer believe that. At one point we thought the earth, the earth was flat. We no longer believe that. So if people were going by what they commonly believed, they would say the Quran is wrong. But science is the one that's always changing. And any scientist will tell you this. Right, science constantly develops and changes, so we cannot use science as the furqan, as the ultimate criteria to judge what is right and wrong. Right, because even in the last hundred years, how many new things have we discovered? There you go, somebody, Jazakallah uh, Khair Akhi. Somebody, uh, this I had to study this book, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. Okay, Jazakallah uh, Khair Akhi Walid. So, this is the book. This is one of the most cited books, if not the most cited book on the philosophy of science, at least when I was studying it, or one of the most cited. And it basically talks about, and he gives examples, how people thought certain things or they used certain lenses to understand the world that were later proven wrong, okay? So you cannot say, okay, uh, there, science says this, the Quran says this 1400 years ago, therefore it's, it's correct. And sometimes what happens is, is Muslims try to reinterpret the verses to fit in with science. We don't need to do that. You don't need to do that, right? So, so we need to be cautious, right? I personally would much rather go with arguments one and two than, than the one about scientific consistency. Um, but uh, just something you need to be careful of because sometimes what happens is if there's a new scientific discovery, right? Like for example, Pluto, Pluto in the last 20 years, they thought it was a planet, now it's not a dwarf planet and they've discovered new things around it or, you know, so they're constantly discovering different things. So um, the point is, I would personally rather go with one and two, right, which actually come from the Quran themselves, right, and just be careful with scientific consistency. Now, that's not to say I never mention it, but I'm always very cautious with how I word it, and I don't rely on this as my number one go-to argument. Okay, next, when we come back, we're going to, I think this is the last section. Yeah, this is the last section. And then we're going to open it up to a discussion, uh, brainstorming, questions, all sorts of things. Okay. And I would, uh, so inshallah, we're going to break from now until two o'clock. So one hour for your lunch and salah. And then we'll come back at two o'clock and then we'll finish off the last section uh, with, um, uh, yes, with this, with this part. I would just kindly request if you guys can make sure all your names are written uh, as they are so we know who's here. Uh, uh, so yeah, so we know exactly who's here and, and just if you have, I think that's, yeah, everybody has their name. Jazakum Okay, so we'll come back. We'll see you at uh, two o'clock. I'm going to pause the recording. If I forget, somebody please remind me to uh, uh, restart it. Jazakum Okay, we'll see you guys at two o'clock, inshallah. Okay, so let's continue, inshallah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبيه الكريم. So we only have about you know four slides left um, and then we'll open it up to discussion questions. Um,
comments, feedback, uh, shall Allah be more uh, interactive. So this section is responding to other religions. Naturally, when you're giving dawah, you're gonna have to respond to other isms, other beliefs. Um, and let's, let's talk about one of the most common ones, Bismillah. Um, let's talk about responding to Christianity. Um, Christians, as we all know, they believe that, and they believe in a Trinitarian God, right? So they believe in, they say it's one God, but three uh, persons in that one God. And they say, and if it doesn't make sense, it's okay, because not to be disrespectful, yeah. their, uh, their belief literally does not make sense. Yeah, it goes against logic. So, um, so, and Christians, the honest ones, they'll tell you, you know what, we, we can't understand it, we just believe in it. Right. Um, so anyway, so Christians believe that God is one, but three persons and each of these persons is not the other. Um, <laughs> so I know that it can be confusing. So what is our evidence that Jesus is not God or the son of God as they claim? Let's talk about the first claim uh, evidence against Jesus being God. OK. Allah says in the Quran, بَعْدَ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِنَّ مَثَلَ عِيسَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ آدَمْ Indeed, the similitude or the example of Jesus in the sight of God is like that of Adam. He created him from dust and he said, be and he was. Now, Christians make the claim that Jesus is the son of God because he has no father. So if we take this logic, we take their logic, we say, okay, Adam had no father and no mother. No father and no mother. So then why do you guys not say the same thing about Adam? Okay. So it highlights a contradiction in their belief. And there are many contradictions in their beliefs. Okay. Because it's, it's man-made. So with Adam, السلام, we highlight Adam had no father, no mother. And Adam didn't even go through childhood. Adam was born a man. Right. Born a full-size man, even bigger than what we are today. So... So we use their logic against them, essentially, right? So that's the first claim that we make. The other example is Jesus ate food. And this is mentioned in the Quran, him and his mother Mary, they ate food, okay? Now, does God eat food? Because what Christians say is that Jesus was God and human at the same time, which is a contradiction, okay? You can't be God and, and you can't be all knowing and not knowing at the same time. You can't be all powerful and weak at the same time. It, it doesn't make sense. So they say, they say, uh, you know, uh, that's what they say. And the Quran mentions that, you know, they used to eat food. And not only that, but according to the Bible, Jesus fasted and he was hungry. So I asked the pastor once, I was like, God was hungry? And he's like, yes. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So, so Jesus eating food, Mary eating food, these are signs. These are signs that. Jesus السلام, and his mother are not divine. And this is what's mentioned in the Quran. Another example, Allah makes a question. Allah poses the question in Surah Al-Ma'idah. And it, it, the translation is, who could prevent Allah at all if he had intended to destroy Al-Masih, Isa, the son of Mary, or his mother, or everybody, uh, the son, uh, sorry, Isa, the son of Mary, or his mother, or everyone on earth. And to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them. So Allah says, if Allah, if, if Allah wanted to destroy Jesus, his mother, السلام, and everybody on earth, is there anybody who could prevent Allah from doing so? And I've actually asked this to Christians before. And the response, they cannot answer this. Why? Because they say something like, well, God would never do that. I say, well, you guys say that, but according to you, he sacrificed his only son. So don't tell me he would not do that, right? This is mentioned, so don't tell me he would not do that. So if they say, if they say, and th this is the wisdom of Allah Azza wa and the Quran, okay? If they say, uh, yes, somebody could stop Allah, Jesus could stop Allah, that means they're not one because their will is not the same. And if they say, no, nobody could stop Allah, that also means they're not one because that means Jesus is less than God, according to them. So, so what we say is, what we say is, this question basically answers their aqidah and it shows the holes in it. It shows the holes in it. And one thing that Christians say is, well, you know, you just got to believe, you just got to believe. And I say to them, 
you know, okay, if Christianity was the only religion on the planet and you told me you just got to believe, I say, okay, that's a different discussion. But you have tens and tens and tens of religions. And how are we, what are we supposed to use to differentiate truth from falsehood? Obviously, intellect, which we all agree God gave us, right? So we're using intellect to show them that they are wrong. Okay? And, and there's more arguments that can be made. For example, if Allah wanted to, to, if Allah had a son, right, why would he pick a human being? He has many creations. He could have taken an angel. He could have taken something else. Why a human being? Why only one? Right? And the other thing is, for example, like who would, it, who would the partner be? If they're likening God to humans, who would, who would the mother be? Who would the partner? They don't say Mary, right? Because according to them, she's, she's the mother of God and, and not the mother of God at the same time and the creation of God at the same time. So, so again, it shows you the contradictions in their aqidah, in their belief. And I want to highlight something. This is very, very important. So I need your attention here. None of these arguments, they reference the Bible. None of these arguments reference the Bible. And I was speaking to uh, Sister Fatima at the booth recently. And I was explaining kind of like my approach to this. When I used to watch Dr. Zachary Nike and others, I used to come and I used to memorize verses of the Bible. In fact, I used to spend hours studying the Bible. But I've realized that you don't need the Bible to give da'wah. You really don't. And I said, if I'm going to study, why would I spend so much time studying the Bible when I could spend even more time studying the Quran? Right? So unless I've memorized the entire Quran, its meaning, its tafsir, then, then why would I spend time studying their book right? after I know what's the truth and what's not? So my approach is this. I don't reference the Bible usually. I don't highlight. I don't say Jesus said according to the Bible that you know the Father is greater than I or this and that. I don't do that. I'll tell you why. Because then it becomes a battle of interpretation. Because then we'll say, for example... Uh, I'll say, for example, Jesus said uh, the father is greater than I will say, oh, well, in this verse, Jesus is prophesied. You know, there's a prophecy that Jesus is going to come and they're talking about this and this and that. So it becomes a battle of interpretation. But at the end of the day, have we proven that Jesus actually said those statements? Have we proven that this is from God 100% of it? So I don't even, I don't entertain that. I just kind of bypass all of that. And I go, I attack their core beliefs not using their Bible. And when I do use the Bible, it's to show that, uh, it's to show that, number one, the people who wrote it, right, aren't who we think we are, aren't who, you know, we think they are, or they think they are. And number two, that we don't even know the authors of the Gospels. Number three, the book of John, you know, things like, like the book of John was written 90 years after Isa alayhi uh, And number four, they contradict each other. And, and even number five, you know, how there has been forgeries and it was written in a, in a language other than what Jesus himself uh, spoke. The Bible was written in Greek. Uh, Jesus spoke Aramaic. So I highlight, I, I question the authenticity of the Bible, essentially. And I say that we found roughly, you know, we found thousands of manuscripts of the Bible and no two are identical. So there's many ways to go about it. But again, it goes back to the situation, what the person's saying, how, how knowledgeable of a Christian they are, right? Some Christians who have very little knowledge of the scripture, yes, I do quote the Bible. Because I know that they're not going to respond to me with, oh, well, this verse says this, and I'm going to reinterpret this. No. If I know that they, they have very little knowledge, then yes, I make them doubt themselves. But a Christian who knows the Bible, at least even a little bit, I don't go down that path. Because then it's going to say, well, we're, uh, we interpret this Bible verse and this verse, and we go with this interpretation. But they haven't even proven that Jesus said those words. So, so I hope that makes sense. Okay. Now, uh, Sikhism. Sikhism is one that we, there's many things that we can discuss. Obviously, I'm speaking about Sikhism because in Surrey, it's a huge Sikh population. Okay. Now, we need to understand a couple of things about Sikhism. Okay. Sikhism was founded by Guru Nanak, Guru means teacher, in Punjab area in the 1400s. So it's one of the world's newest religions. Okay. 1400s, 15th century. Uh, their belief is essentially that all faith, all faiths lead to heaven, but their way is the best way. The Sikhi way is the best way. Right, and Sikh actually means student, and Guru means teacher. Right, so in in the Punjabi language, so so all faiths lead to heaven, but Sikhi way is the best way. That's that's what they believe. So they say, according to their Bible, and according to my discussions with Sikhs, if for example, uh, according not their Bible, sorry, the, uh, we're going to talk about their scripture. Um, 
they say that if a Muslim is a good Muslim, he's going to go to his Jannah. He's going to go to Jannah. Christian, he's going to go to his Jannah. He's going to go to the Jannah. Okay? So they, they, they say that's what they believe. Okay? And they do not believe in Yawm Al-Qiyamah. They don't believe in Judgment Day. They, rather, they believe in reincarnation. So if you're a good person, you're going to, reborn, you're going to be reborn as a Sikh. If you're not, you might be reborn as something else. Maybe an animal, a lion, something. I, I don't know, something. Um, so that is the, that's their belief in a nutshell. Okay? Obviously, there's a lot more, but, but this, these are the basics. Their scripture is called the Guru Granth Sahib, which they believe is like the living guru, the everlast, their lasting guru, right? Um, uh, and it's a, a fun fact is that it actually some Muslim, it has some Muslim authors. It has some Muslim authors. Okay. And now whether or not the Muslims intended for that or not, that's a different discussion. But uh, it does have Muslim authors. And they say, the, the six, they say that Guru Nanak actually performed Hajj. And their story is that whichever direction he, he turned, the Kaaba was there in front of him. So I'd like to see historical documents proving that, but, um, or some historical testimony proving that. But anyways, that's what they say. They say he actually performed Hajj. Okay? Now, their scripture asserts that the Quran and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all, they all come from or sent by the one creator. They say that they're a monotheistic religion. That's what they say. But, they're, but, they're, but they're, their scripture and their actions prove otherwise, okay? So they say that the Quran and, uh, and Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace and blessings be upon him, all come from, sent by the one creator. So therefore, our argument when we're speaking to six is they say, okay, you believe in the Quran? They say, yes. They're going to say, yes. They're going to say, yes, it was sent by God. Okay, you believe in Prophet Muhammad as a messenger of God? Yes, we do. And if they say no, I'd be shocked if they said no. They'll say yes, likely, right? Or almost in all cases, they'll say yes if they're actually sick. So I'll say, okay, so why don't you follow the Quran and the final messenger when it says that he's the final messenger? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when it says that there's no, not going to be anybody after him, right? And the hadith and what he taught us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So my approach to, to speaking with six is, is saying, okay, well, you guys believe in the Quran, you believe in this, they'll say, yes, 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 yes. So I'll say, okay, if you, if you believe that the Quran was sent from God, so why do you, so then why do you not follow it? It says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the final messenger, so th there's no need for Guru Nanak, there's no need for others. And obviously you don't do this in a disrespectful way, but you do it, you know, in a, in, in a polite way, in a gentle way. Uh, but that's, that's essentially our response to Sikhism, based off, you know, my, my study of the religion. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Now, uh, any questions about this or Christianity? We have, I think, one last slide before we conclude. Just while we're on these slides. This was Sikhism and Christianity. And again, we, we talk about this because these are the most commonly, uh, these are the ones that, you know, come to the booth <laughs> the most, I guess. Um, and many Sikhs are like, you know, they have exposure to Islam, obviously, because, you know, uh, India was once ruled by the Mughals, which is Muslim, Muslim rulers. Um, so they, they all know about Islam, and, um, but there's different considerations, I guess, when it comes to converting, which is what I find interesting, because they say that you can still go to Jannah if you're a Muslim, but some families, uh, they go to the extent of even, you know, even, even like physical violence uh, against uh, people who uh, revert from Sikhism to Islam. Okay, last slide. These are just generally, these are, okay, I'm going to uh, close my camera. Okay, just so hopefully I'm not lagging. Okay, these are just some general um, notes when actually talking to people. When you're on the street and you're giving dawah, uh, you know we smile towards people, right? You know, you know I'm not going to be overly smiling towards the sister, obviously, but you know, just you're 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 greeting people in a, in a in a you're greeting them in a nice way. Greet them kindly, you know, and and I'll I'll give you guys some examples of things we actually say. Um, do not be forceful. Right, like, like, you know, we're not like, you know, I don't know if you, when you guys go to some places in the world, you know, people who sell you like perfume, sometimes they come and like grab you by the arm, right? And they say, come, come, come. <laughs> and then they literally put the thing, they put the, the perfume on your hand, right? So we're not like that, right? We are, we are, we're not forceful. We just invite, we offer, but we are not forceful. Um, here are some example statements, sentences that we use. Hey, how are you? Not even about religion, because they can read our signs. 
Remember, they can read our signs, so they probably know what, what this is about. So all you're saying is, hey, how's it going? And then that might be what starts the conversation, what makes them feel welcome to come to the booth. Um, hey, would you be interested in some reading material about Islam or some reading material? Oh, what's this about, right? Um, hey, we're here educating the, the public on the world's most misrepresented religion. Do you have a moment? Or another thing you could say is like, hey, what do you know about Islam? We're here educating people about, you know, one of the world's most misrepresented religions. So these are kind of some things that you guys, you know, that we can say. Um, and, and I found that these are pretty successful. Alhamdulillah, especially when we have our posters out, which clearly show that we're talking about Islam. Um, so you don't need to be, you know, be very explicit about what you're there for, right? Okay, I've, I've spoken a lot today. Any questions before we open it up to like comments, feedback, uh, et cetera, suggestions, scenarios, uh, any general questions about da Ask a Muslim, Dawa, uh, anything, like anything related to anything we've talked about today. You can type, you can unmute yourself. No questions? You guys hear me? Hope you guys can hear me. I think you can. No? I can hear you. Yeah. Um, I do not have a question. I like. I have a comment. About discussing other religions. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I completely agree with you that we should not really discuss other scriptures because we have not even established that they come from God. There is no actual evidence that they come from God. They, people just believe that, mm -hmm. like baseless beliefs. So uh, I completely agree that we should not really go that way. Plus, uh, I've seen people, like, aside from people, like, seeking the truth and studying the Bible just in case before they, like, arrive in Islam. Um, like, I I've seen, like, we have Bibles in the booth itself. And I always think that we should keep matters simple. Because if you look at the way the Prophet used to call people, which is... The, what we follow, the Prophet. I've never heard that the Prophet was walking around with a Bible and a Torah and telling people, oh, see, this is a problem in the Torah. All he did was, there is one God, I am the last Prophet. He read Quran and made some logical arguments, for example, um, like the, lo the logical arguments that are present in the Quran. He mm. never, like, followed, uh, as I said, like, he never. Um, refuted any scripture by going to the scripture itself. Yeah, that's yeah. that's something that I, I haven't seen in my study of, of a hadith or, or Islam. Yeah. I've never come across any narration that says, for example, they quoted, you know, the book of Psalms or book of Genesis. And, you know, uh, you know, obviously the Quran mentions that it, it highlights the fact that the, 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 the scripture has been changed. Right. Right. So woe to those who say, right, who basically who write the scripture with their own hands and say that it's from God. So this is mentioned, if you look at the tafsir of this, it mentions how uh, the hadith clearly mentions that the, the scriptures have been changed. So I, I definitely um, uh, agree with you on the fact that, you know, we, we shouldn't be overly delving into other scriptures because the Quran is from the most wise and, you know, what Quran al Hakim, it's even called, it's, 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 it's described as being wise, the Quran itself. So, um, so that's been my approach. I found that, alhamdulillah, more successful than, than relying on biblical verses because then it just becomes a battle of interpretation and you don't even know if Isa salam ever said those things. Now, the, the one thing I would say though, just, you know, I would, I would say that as Muslims, we don't go and say like the Bible itself, the, the whole Bible is wrong, right? Because the Bible is, it says that Allah is one, for example, in the Old Testament. It says, you know, do not associate partners with God. So these are things we obviously agree with, and we can we can say that you know yes, if Allah said these, then these of course these are true. Um, but you know, we also don't say that all of it is right, 
right? So there's a balance there, right? And some Muslims think that the Bible itself is 100% wrong, but of course, you know, uh, that, that's, that is not correct. So we say that, yes, there is some truth in it, but it, the difference is that it is not the Furqan. It is not the criteria for judging what is right and wrong. The Quran is. So what's consistent with the Quran, we say, Alhamdulillah. What is not, we say, no, we don't accept this. And what's in between, you know, Allah knows best. Do you want yes, anything? Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Akhi. Do you want anything? No, I just wanted to confirm that I, I do agree. Plus, like the term itself, da'wah, it means like calling people. It's not arguing with people. Yes, yes. Our it's main goal is to convey the message, not argue with people. Hundred yeah. percent. And and people know, like I mean, people who've been to the da'wah in person, uh, you know, the majority of people, the overwhelming majority, do not come to argue. They they're clueless about Islam. <laughs> like like the majority of people don't know anything about Islam. They're lost. They're going through different things. Uh, there's, you know, there's very few debates. And when somebody does come up to the booth and they say, "Well, what about Sharia law?" Right? This person obviously just comes to debate. I, I'm personally, I've never had actually. I don't know if you guys have seen anyone at the booth. I've never had somebody come up and just say, "What about Sharia?" <laughs> um, but uh, these kind of people, they come to debate. Right? They come with their mind already made up. But most of the people, in my experience, Alhamdulillah, are not like that. Um, so I'll go to Sister Ruby had a question. Um, this, it's great that you that you covered how to speak to uh, respond to people with different religions. Do you have some guidance how to speak with people who follow Hinduism? Okay, Hinduism is a tough one because and the reason it's tough is not because you know we can't answer it. It's because there's no you know central there's no universally agreed upon uh, belief system in Hinduism, right? Hindus believe different things. Right. And so you could speak to a Hindu who says God is one and you could speak to a Hindu who says that God is 300. Right. So, you know, you could speak. <laughs> There's so much diversity in Hinduism. But what we can say in general is, you know, get to know the person's beliefs. Right. Because once they speak, you, you, you'll see the irrationality in their belief. They'll say, well, you know, we believe in one supreme God, but one one God for for the weather. I say, OK, well, what if the God for the weather doesn't want it wants it to rain? And what if the supreme God? wants it to, to be sunny, right? So, so there's these things. They believe, for example, in reincarnation. They believe, for, uh, okay, look at their scripture. The, um, the, uh, the Vedas, right? The Vedas, yeah. So their, their scripture, right? It's disputed who actually wrote it, right? They don't actually know who wrote it and even when, right? Um, and the other thing, there's aspects of Hinduism such as the caste system, which you can talk about how it leads to some, you know, severe, you know, uh, injustices and, and violence. And, you know, there's been, you know, uh, so, so we can talk about caste system. And that's, it's actually been a reason why many people have left Hinduism, right? The caste system, how they see the Brahmins at the top. And there's like a caste system that you're born into and you can't get out, right, uh, by and large. Um, so there's many ways to approach it. But you got to know what the Hindu in front of you actually believes. Um, so it's tough to give a general answer because, again, Unlike other religions, Hinduism can be so broad and people have so many different beliefs. So, yeah, that's what I would say regarding that. Um, does anybody want to add anything regarding Hinduism? Uh, can we get a copy of this to review again later? Yes, I'm going to, inshallah, it is recorded. I'm going to share the recording in the uh, Ask a Muslim uh, WhatsApp group, inshallah, afterwards. So it'll be there. And uh, and yeah, and feel free to share it with other people. Yeah, it's not like yeah. it's not secretive that way. Uh, I, I had a, one question, brother, um, uh, regarding the, the people who drop by the booth. Like, yes. um, obviously, you know, you have uh, faced a lot of uh, conversation and whatnot. But you, generally speaking, um, what are the main background they come from? Are they mostly like agnostic, atheist, or Christians or Jews? I'm just curious to know their mm -hmm. uh, their background in terms of you know the, the number of persons shows up in, in our dawa book. Very good question. Um, in, in my experience, you have, you have many different, you have many different uh, groups there. Now, one thing that's interesting about Surrey Central, because, you know, the, the population there has a lot of, 
you know, homeless, uh, you know, homeless people and, and people addicted to drugs, sometimes people come with very distinct beliefs. So they're not typically Christian. They're not typically atheist. They might come and they believe like, you know, these, these spirits speak to me. And, you know, I, like one guy last week, he said, or the week before that, yeah, last week he said, I'm a prophet of God. I'm a messenger of God. And he started dancing. <laughs> he started mm -hmm. dancing in front of us. So, yeah. uh, uh, and, you know, he put on his headphones, literally started dancing in front of us. Um, <laughs> so, so you get people like that. There's not really, you get a lot of Christians, obviously, Hispanics. Um, uh, and Hispanics are, mashallah, like, like a lot of them are very open-minded uh, to learning about Islam. And we do have, alhamdulillah, material in Spanish. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's very different. But I would say a lot of Christians, obviously. And, uh, and then some people with kind of like fringe, you know, religions or beliefs. And, um, and obviously some atheists. But atheists, I would say, uh, yeah, you, you, definitely get, you definitely get a few atheists. Yeah. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah, and just uh, I had uh, one uh, another question, brother. Uh, like okay. down the road, do we have plans to expand the booth to say Coquitlam or other other uh, places? Hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah, we started out as a federally incorporated uh, in corporation. Um, so we, the plan is basically to make Ask a Muslim national, or at least at least. Western Canada, mm -hmm. um, because Alhamdulillah in the in the East Coast you do have like Ayira, you have other organizations, different provinces you have here and there, um, some Dawa uh, Dawa initiatives. So we want, Inshallah, we want to eventually go national or at least cover Western Canada. Um, so there's a plan. The issue is finding people who, you know, who are like I guess you could say committed, reliable enough, uh, you know, who share the same vision to run those other booths. So, for example, if I knew somebody in Coquitlam right now who said, like, you know, brother, uh, I'm, I'm willing, and somebody I know and I trust, I say, brother, I, I'm willing to take the booth full time, you know, once a week, um, you know, just get me the material. Alhamdulillah, money, money is not an issue. Alhamdulillah, we have funds. And, you know, I was going to update people about the tent later on, but it's just about finding people who can uh, commit and who are, who are trustworthy and reliable. Um, yeah. and if you find me, then please let me know. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we can sit down and, you know, if you have somebody in mind, uh, please message me directly and we can, we can discuss, uh, because we do want to grow the Dawa. We want to have consistent Dawa boosts. Coquitlam needs Dawa. I mean, South Surrey, White Rock, where I am needs Dawa. We are, we spoke to the city of White Rock. It's been tough because they have a lot of rules and regulations. Um, but, um, Alhamdulillah. So that, that's pretty much the answer, but yeah, go ahead. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, brother. My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, and yes, Sister uh, Muge, Jazakillah Khair, she, she said, yeah, we have indigenous visitors too. Absolutely. Um, I, I just would like to interject here. Uh, go ahead again. Because this is a concern that I have. Uh, I think things are going a bit organically, like in terms of expansion. Yes. I think it, if we want to expand, we, will, we need to like further organize ourselves. Like, for example, do we know where each one of us lives? What their capabilities are? Uh, what free time do they have? Like, I think we can easily get that information simply by asking and like, creating a simple database yeah. of like the resources that we have, when they what they can do and when they can do it. Yeah. Uh, so I think I believe like this is a blessed work that needs to expand, but yes. uh, maybe we we should uh, revisit at least uh, like the plan to expand mm -hmm. our, and what is needed because it's not just a matter of providing a tent and having a person because that person could be like very committed today and get sick like uh, three yeah. months uh, down the line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so you need sort of some sort of organization and it's not very hard thing to do. Yeah. But we, we just need like the process or the system to be in place to yeah. make sure that w whatever happens, like for example, uh, I've been struggling uh, with telling people that we're gonna be in the booth every Saturday because we used to start at two, now we start at 12. Sometimes we stop at like, uh, like back up at five, 5.30. Um, one of the things that actually teased me is that the, the Christian group sometimes seem more active than us. <laughs> like they yeah. start earlier and sometimes leave 
uh, later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. like, this sort of organization, I think, is something that we, like, need to improve on because we have so many people in the group that we can benefit from. It's only a matter of just, like, organizing the whole thing to make sure that everything works in uh, synergy. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, I would just, um, sorry, was somebody trying to say something? Or... Okay. Yeah, no, so what we've noticed is, um, so, so I, I agree with you that we, you know, alhamdulillah, we have a, you know, we have like, I think like last time I checked, it was like almost 80 people in the group. The, the issue is, and to be very honest, Ethi, is that, you know, not everybody in the group actually comes to the DAO booth. In fact, the overwhelming majority don't. Uh, that's just a fact, right? And that's fine. You know, people want to stay up to date on what's going on. They want to benefit from the shared content. That's totally fine. And also some people, you know, maybe don't want to give street dawah, but they want to give, you know, dawah to people at work. So that's all of that's fine. But what we've noticed in terms of finding people who are committed, uh, it can be it, it can be tough. And the other thing is, but it's something inshallah we can discuss because if you have a plan and you want to make like a, a formal, you know, uh, database and we can see who's available, who's not, I'm all for that. I'm all for that because then we can have something in writing and see, okay, maybe this person can cover one week a month. It's better to do one week a month in Coquitlam than never, right? Um, and the other thing that's important to note is that everybody is, including myself, we're all doing this part-time. So, so um, we pretty much just give, you know, do what we can on the side. Some of us are able to offer more time than others, um, more time than others. But, uh, but yeah, so if it was a full-time operation, I'd say very different story. <laughs> And eventually we do have a plan. Eventually, we've talked about this before and eventually something our community needs. Um, we don't necessarily have a concrete plan, but it's a, it's a vision, inshallah, you know, to have a full-time dawah center. Full-time dawah center, somewhere that people can go pretty much Monday to Friday, uh, like, like any business essentially, where they come and there's somebody running the, uh, running the area, but you have to think about how do you get funding for that? Um, you know, who's going to run it, et cetera. So that, that's all that's part of the vision. If we have people who are able to commit with their time and effort, that's great. Inshallah, we'll use them, uh, you know, where we consider it appropriate. But uh, Jazakallah khair for bringing that energy and that, that you know, the breath of, uh, breath of fresh air because we need that uh, to take it to the next level, inshallah. Uh, but we're also, alhamdulillah, happy that we're able to be consistent with our dawah booth, right? That, that was, that's a focus of ours. We just don't want it to let this go. And, you know, at the same time, expand at the same time. So, Jazakallah khair. Um, I'm going to just, so there's a couple more questions that came in. I'm going to answer these and we can, inshallah, uh, go back to other things, inshallah, if, if that's what's requested. Um, what to say to people who believe in one God, higher power, they give it different names, but doesn't understand why they can worship, uh, be grateful their way. Uh, they don't understand having the etiquettes of a Muslim covering, lowering gaze, even if you say this is the way Allah wants you or wants to be worshipped. Okay, so the first thing some people say, they, you know, we worship the universe or the universe has a plan, the universe. And then, you know, I would ask them, well, like, you, you say the universe, but like, you know, the universe has a beginning, right? And if they say no, then you would say, well, no, that's not what science says, right? So you have to understand, you have to ask them, what do you mean by universe, right? And then you can ask them, okay, well, like, like, and then you could probe them and say, well, okay, well, you're understanding the universe. Is it possible, right? Is it possible that you are referring to an actual being, an ultimate all-knowing being? And they may say yes or no. If they say no, I'll say, well, why? Because if, if the universe is doing anything, then don't you think it, it, it's more powerful than us, right? So they call it a different name. You were just trying to make them realize that the universe is not just a random creation, but they're, what they're calling the universe in reality, is, is actually Allah Azza wa Jal, and they need to acknowledge that it is Allah Azza wa Jal, right? That's the, that's the difference, right? And we need, we would need to um, highlight those things that are consistent with Islam and, and, and um, you know, clarify the things that are not consistent. For example, I had a coworker once who believed that we're all God, right? And we all, we all, we're all creators, we're all part of God. And I say, well, okay, well, like, can, can I make a human being myself? No, I can't. Can I, can I give myself ever? Can I make myself live forever? No, I can't. So you kind of highlight, you clarify their position and then they realize what's logical, what's Ill illogical. So there's many people, many, many people who kind of fall under this category. 
where they believe in a higher power, but they don't call it God. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing uh, regarding uh, etiquettes of a Muslim, they don't understand having the etiquettes, even if you say this is how the way Allah wants to be worshipped. Again, it depends on what they're saying in terms of how you would respond. But again, some people, some people, it's the same for them, whether you want them or don't want them, or don't want them, they'll never believe. So, so just, you know, you do what you can, use wisdom, use gentleness, use kindness, use knowledge. And if they don't understand, they don't understand. You know, some people can never understand, like, you know, for example, you know, why we pray. Why does God need you to pray? But they don't realize God does not need us to pray. We are the ones in need of prayer, right? As Allah says in the Quran, Antumul fuqara'u ila Allah. You are the ones who are in need of Allah. Wallahu huwa al al hamid. And Allah, he's the one who is free of need and the praiseworthy. So, um, okay. Uh, I also have great concerns about seeing Muslim youths who do not follow teachings of Allah and his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I don't want to go into it, it's reason why our youth are going away from our beautiful religion, uh, whether here in North America or in so-called Muslim uh, countries like Pakistan. But I wanted to know how we can approach them without provoking their anger or frustration so they become practicing Muslims. Okay, uh, excellent question, Jazakallah um, khair. As, as, um, as somebody who works with youth, Alhamdulillah, I'm a teacher, and I teach the middle, you know, high school age, middle school age, um, you have to use a lot of hikmah and gentleness when it comes to youth. I'll give you an example. There was, uh, and I'm not saying I have this. I'm just, I'm just giving an example of something that uh, you know I felt like worked well. Uh, and 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 brother Ahmed was there. Um, there was a young young man who came uh, uh, with uh, with a black brother, and he he's Muslim. He says he's from Victoria. He's Muslim. He's kind of dressed, kind of like a kind of dressed like you know some youth dress youth uh, youth dress. Specifically, and specifically kind of like youth that are kind of into music culture, rap culture. That's kind of how he was dressed. He came up to me and, and uh, he came up to the booth and he said he has some questions. He wants to speak to a scholar. And basically, I told him, I said, okay, like, 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 ask me. I'm not a scholar, but, you know, if I can answer your question, great. If I can't, I can, I can refer you to a scholar or get the answer myself from a scholar. So he said, okay, so we have, uh, we do like these uh, events where we have music and we have different artists come in. And, 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 and play, uh, but uh, we don't have alcohol. We don't serve alcohol. Is this okay or is it not okay Islamically? So I told them, first of all, I was just very happy that this young man, mashallah, he's coming, speaking to us. He cares about his religion enough that he's asking us. So I told him, first of all, Jazakallah khair, uh, you know, may Allah reward you for not using music, uh, for not using alcohol. And yes, you're right about that. You know, so I, I thanked him and I tried to encourage him in that respect. But at the same time, I have to be honest with them. And I have to say, so in Islam, the, 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 what's considered haram is the ma'azif, right? The, the um, musical instruments, right? So, and, and I mentioned the hadith, how the Prophet said, So how there will be people from my ummah who will make things that are uh, impermissible, permissible, such as khamir, adultery. Um, uh, what was the other one? Uh, khamra, sorry, uh, adultery and silk, uh, silk and uh, musical instruments. So I said Islamically, what is impermissible is the musical instruments. And also, you know, if you're having a rapper, for example, come in and just swearing and talking about women and drugs and blah, 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 all of, obviously that's not okay as well. So I, I try to, you know, give them the right information in a gentle way without them feeling judged. For our youth, it takes a lot of hikmah dealing with them. Um, and you want to bring them closer to the religion and you don't want to push them away. So really what I, what I tell parents and just people working with youth is you got to pick your battles. Your, 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 your teenager is not going to be, for example, uh, you know, entering the house and saying every dua, every sunnah dua, you know, eating with the right hand and not listening to music trying to grow their beard, praying every salah and tahajjud and, and, and fasting Monday and Thursday are all year round. Like that's unlike, like not, not that's unlikely. Who is like that amongst us, right? Especially amongst our youth, who? So you have to look at the reality and most of our youth are not like that. So pick your battles. Okay, your kid listen to music sometimes. Okay, they know it's haram. Don't like keep pushing them away from, you know, pushing them away, right? 
At the same time, you have to emphasize that the number one thing that they cannot compromise on whatsoever is Tawheed. As Luqman uh, والسلام, says, Ya Bunayya la tushrik billah inna shirka la dhulman azim. This is the first thing Luqman, who Allah calls as, describes as wise, he says to his son, he says, Oh my son, do not associate partners with Allah, for indeed associating partners with Allah is a grave transgression. It's a grave wronging. Okay? So that's my, this, you know, youth, that's a whole nother halakha, but that's kind of a, a brief answer. Um, and Allah guides whom he wills. I mean, I think when I was a teenager, when I was a teenager, you know, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. So we just can't give up on our youth. Allah guides whom he wills. Um, so we just keep making du'a for our youth. Uh, I think we provide opportunities to sisters with knowledge of Islam and da'wah from home via Zoom call, etc. instead of standing at a booth in public. I personally feel more comfortable uh, with this. Da'wah from home. Yeah, I mean, da'wah from home, it's, um, you know, this is, it's good to know this. Uh, we can keep this in mind because let's say, for example, you don't want to, um, you don't want to do da'wah on the street, which I, I completely understand that not everybody is. But if you want to help a new Muslim, if you want to help a new Muslim, or you want to maybe give a halaqa, or you want to, um, you know, be involved in some other way, absolutely, absolutely. So inshallah, I mean, alhamdulillah, we've had a recent transition in our organization. Uh, so once things settle, once we, once we, you know, get a routine going, inshallah, we can, we can figure out um, how to make use of all our talents. Uh, because we do have a lot of talents, Allahumma zidu wa barik, and people who want to help, and it may not be in the form of street dawah, but uh, people who can help and can offer a lot. Um, personally, I think that sister standing in the dawah booth is a good option so that the Muslim brothers don't have to talk to the females about questions about uh, Islam. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's some questions, obviously, that sisters may ask. And keep in mind, many Muslims attend our booth and they ask us for different things. And um, so, so I personally like having sisters at the booth when everything is going well, because, you know, in the sight of non-Muslims, like they're going to say, oh, Islam is a woman that oppresses. If they think Islam is a woman, that, uh, Islam is a religion that oppresses women and keeps them in their home all the time. And if they go to a booth about Islam and they don't see a single woman there repeatedly, right? What can they think, right? So um, that doesn't mean, I would we change the religion for non-Muslims. But if a sister's coming, she's following our rules. She's, she's, she's modest. Same thing with the brothers. They're following the rules. They're modest. They're, they're, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not doing what they're not supposed to be doing then inshallah, there's khair in that. Um, and uh, yes, and it is a good representation of our religion when people come to the booth and see both men and women sharing knowledge and don't think that Muslim women are just uh, locked up in the house and not allowed to go out. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. Uh, yes, jazakumullah khair wa iyakum. Okay, um, we're, approaching, uh, we're approaching three o'clock. Any other questions, comments, feedback? These are all great ideas. I want to say if anybody at any point has any feedback, uh, anything that you think we can improve our organization, um, you know, please message me. Uh, my number is in the uh, in the group. We also have a, an official email which I'll share with the group, um, and that's also where you can send e-transfers if you want to donate. So it's askamuslimcanada at gmail.com. And um, we do have a website, askamuslim.ca, which Brother Ari helped us set up. Allah um, yajihil khair. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, we should have uh, different options for different sisters. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I know, I know some sister, like, you know, at least, at least, you know, one that comes to mind who used to come, no, more than one, who came to the booth and then they no longer went for different reasons. So, uh, you know, uh, I understand. Um, uh, Alhamdulillah, as long as we're not doing anything that's displeasing to Allah or goes against the religion, I, um, Alhamdulillah, then, and it can bring good, then, then why not do it, right? Uh, uh, somebody asked, could you do a halaqa on youth issues, please? Um, Alhamdulillah, I, I'm not sure if you saw the, um, uh, recently I did a halaqa at Richmond Masjid about the fitness of public schools. It's not directly about youth, but really like everything mentioned in that is kind of what our youth are going through. Um, there is, 
I am working with different massages on uh, that one. No, we had technical issues. Uh, it's not. Um, I am currently working with different uh, organizations and massages to talk about the fitna of public schools. And obviously this goes in line with what our youth are going through. Um, if you know, I'm not sure with which, which, what is your, oh, you're in Calgary. Okay. Um, I was going to say, you know, Calgary is a, is a different kind of, obviously different jurisdiction, but uh, if you want to organize something, if you, you know, with your own religious community there, um, whether it's in person or online, like for example, if you wanted to have me come in, uh, please let me know if you have connections with your local masjid. Um, otherwise, uh, I think future sessions will be recorded and then I'll try to share them in the Ask a Muslim group. If you're not already in it, please join it. Um, but yeah, if, if, um, if you have connections with masajids here or elsewhere and you would like for me to do a halakha on these issues, uh, please let me know. Uh, because I, I personally left public school because the fitna was too much for me to handle. So, and that's like a grown married man. So what about our young, uh, you know, our young ones? So um, there's a lot that can be said, obviously, and especially these days with the fitna of LGBTQ plus, and uh, it, there's a lot, there's a lot. Um, but anyways, okay. Any other uh, questions, comments? Um, anything anybody would like to add? Um, thank you so much for uh, this session. Um, like this is clearly an educational session. Can we have another session for uh, organizational purposes and like sharing the vision and like building the roadmap? Yeah, you know, I'm not. That's a that's a great uh, idea. Sure. I'm not sure if that's. You know, we'll we'll discuss that inshallah, maybe in person or on WhatsApp. I don't know if that would be like a everyone kind of meeting or just some people meeting. Um, but, uh, but I like that idea. And I do think it's good, especially if like yourself, you're willing to take a more active role regarding a future vision and project management. Uh, I think we should make use of that. So let's discuss this inshallah, and then we can go from there. Inshallah. Okay. Okay. Jazakumullah khair everyone. You guys have been amazing. I mean, staying with me for this long. Um, and, uh, yes. Uh, anybody not in, already in the WhatsApp group? Um, I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave my number here. If you're not already in our WhatsApp group, please, uh, and you want to join it, please just text me and I'll add you to the group. Preferably on WhatsApp. Message me on WhatsApp. So that's my number. Uh, just message me if you're not already in the group and I can add you to the group. And that's where we post, uh, you know, all information, uh, DAO notifications, etc. Um, and we have discussions there. Okay. Uh, otherwise, uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to contact me. You know, uh, by email. I'll. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, otherwise, uh, feel free to contact me via Ask a Muslim email, or or there's my number. Jazakumullah uh, khair everyone. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam.